a two-part event. Yep, we heard that. <laughs> All right. This is gonna now we're live. Uh, this is gonna be a two-part event. Um, we're gonna start first. Um, Michelle Evans has kind of a, a unique experience with STS One. Um, so Michelle is gonna start with a uh, with a presentation. So I'm gonna do her introduction, turn it over to her for a minute, and then once after Michelle's presentation, I will introduce the uh, the rest of the panelists. If you have a question, um, enter it into the Q&A. Um, feel free at any time to, uh, to enter questions into the Q&A. Um, if, we, if we have time at the end, we may take some live questions, but you know, like I said, at any time, feel free, um, and we'll just kind of work them in where they're appropriate. Um, I think that's the, uh, I'm, I, if, if you are a panelist and I skip you, as always happens, um, <laughs> Please let me know and I will come back to you. It's not personal, it's not intentional. <laughs> but uh, uh, other than that, thank you to everybody that's come out today. Uh, we, uh, we see the, uh, the, the attendee list, a lot of uh, familiar names in there. So uh, we appreciate everybody joining us today and uh, hope you all have a great time. So to begin with, Michelle Evans is the founder and president of Mach 25 Media and is an aerospace writer, photographer, and communications specialist. She has written the Outward Odyssey book, X-15 Rocket Plane, Flying the First Wings into Space. Michelle's background in aerospace engineering includes serving in the US Air Force, working on missile systems, and later in private industry. Michelle is a distinguished lecturer with the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics, and her book was a finalist for the Eugene M. Emmy Award for Astronautical Literature. She has appeared in numerous publications and was on a was a also a technical consultant on the Neil Armstrong biopic First Man and for National Geographic Television and as we learned today has been uh, touring the world uh, talking about the X15. So uh, Michelle, we appreciate you uh, being willing to open us up with this presentation, and I will turn it over to you. Okay, thank you so much. Let me do the share screen here, and there we go. Hopefully, everybody should see what I got here. Uh, yeah, I'm Michelle Evans. I'd like to welcome everyone to the AIAA celebration of the 40th anniversary of the first launch of the space shuttle program, STS-1. This uh, introductory part of the presentation will not be just about Orbital Vehicle 102, but will also highlight my personal journey with regard to the space shuttle Columbia. To start us off today, I'd like to give us uh, all some background about the first space shuttle to launch into orbit. Here are some milestone dates in the construction and launch, along with some quick statistics about Columbia. It took nearly five years to build the vehicle and prepare her for the first of 28 launches, nearly half of which were dedicated science missions. The name Columbia has a rich history of exploration, dating back to the late 1700s, including the first sailing ship to explore the Columbia River and a naval frigate that was one of the first to sail around the world. It was also the name of the command module on Apollo 11, the first lunar landing. As for the space shuttle Columbia, she was originally supposed to fly in 1979, but technological delays put that off until early 1981. Most people recall the difficulties encountered with the heat tiles, but there was also a significant delay with development of the space shuttle main engines. Once those problems were sorted out and corrected, the launch finally appeared imminent. Less than a month before launch, during a countdown demonstration test, tragedy first befell the vehicle when three men were killed during the operations on the launch pad. They were overcome by nitrogen while working in the aft body of the orbiter. It is little remembered today, but I would like to dedicate this talk today to the memory of John Bornstadt, Frank Cole, and Nick Mullen. The launch was finally ready to happen on 10 April 1981, exactly 40 years ago today, but was scrubbed at T minus 31 seconds because the five computers on board the shuttle could not all sync up and talk to each other. This was all taken in stride by the crew, Commander John Young and pilot Bob Crippen. Two days later on Sunday, 12 April, at 7 a.m. and 3 seconds Eastern time, the three main engines on Columbia and two solid rocket boosters attached to the external tank pushed the vehicle off launch pad 39A at the Kennedy Space Center. About 10 minutes later, she was on orbit. 
The 48-hour delay was actually serendipitous in that the launch also marked the 20th anniversary since the first man flew into space when Yuri Gagarin lifted off on 12 April 1961 for a single Earth orbit from the Soviet Union. For myself, I had recently separated from the Air Force after working on missile systems for more than seven years. I was raised on the space program, never missing a launch or major mission event, no matter what time it occurred. I stayed up all night when watching Neil Armstrong land and walk on the moon in 1969, and 12 years later, I did it again to see Columbia launch, which occurred at 4 a.m. here in California. With the mission scheduled for little more than two days, there was no time for sleep. Even though I worked in aerospace engineering, my first loves were writing and photography, and STS-1 marked the first time I was covering a space flight as accredited news media. I drove up to Edwards on Monday evening and got my place out on the south side of the lake bed to cover the landing. I was in the third spot to the left of the ABC News platform, marked by this red arrow. The media site was a massive hive of activity with press from around the world. Here, ABC News Chief Science Editor Jules Bergman talks about the historic flight of Columbia with Apollo 17 Commander Gene Cernan while we awaited the shovel, shuttle's arrival. And here, science reporter Lynn Shear noted that it wasn't just scientists and engineers that were excited about the flight as she spoke with director Steven Spielberg. Out of the thousands of reporters at the media site, I have the distinction of being the first to have spotted Columbia as she entered the heading alignment circle above our heads. At almost the same moment I took this photo, the distinctive double sonic boom of the space shuttle was heard for the very first time. This NASA image from a chase plane shows the media site and the red arrow again indicates where I was standing and shooting photos during the landing. From that spot, this is what Columbia looked like coming in for her first landing. She sailed majestically in front of us, dropped her landing gear, and finally touched the hard packed surface of the Rogers Dry Lake Bed on Edwards Runway 23 at 1021 AM Pacific on 14 April. This NASA image shows the precision with, with which Young and Crippen put the shuttle orbiter down on California's Mojave Desert. And after fighting the traffic from everyone at the media site trying to get back across the lake bed to the main base, I searched out a decent spot from which to get images of Columbia sitting out on the lake bed. And of course, had to grab a self-portrait along the way. The crew van headed out to pick up Young and Crippen to bring them back to the media site at the Dryden Flight Research Center, where this welcome back Columbia sign greeted them. Here, spaceflight rookie Bob Crippen is enthusiastically talking to the crowd while his commander, now five-time space veteran, John Young, watches. Young said that day, we're not too far, the human race isn't, from going to the stars. It's been a long time coming, but I hope he's right. With all that behind her, Columbia then did a truly remarkable thing for a spacecraft. She was flown back to the Kennedy Space Center atop the 747 shuttle carrier aircraft, refurbished and made ready for a second flight into space exactly seven months later on 12 November 1981. I was back in my same spot on the south side of the lake bed at Edwards at 1.23 p.m. two days later to grab my next set of landing photos. This time was extra special in that the commander of STS-2 was Joe Engel, who had previously flown 16 missions on the X-15 rocket plane in the 1960s from this same location at Edwards Air Force Base. Three of those X-15 research missions qualified Joe for astronaut status, making him the first and only person to become an astronaut before actually entering orbit, and he was also the only space shuttle commander to ever fly the vehicle manually from deorbit burn to landing because of his experience on the X-15. I missed the third shuttle landing when Columbia and the crew of STS-3 were diverted to White Sands, New Mexico, but I was back at Edwards for STS-4 on 4 July 1982. Here is what my typical setup of cameras looked like for the landing that day. Please forgive the old photos. I looked a little different in those old days. 
Now is a heck of a way to celebrate Independence Day to watch Columbia return to Earth for the fourth time. There were approximately one million <coughs> public spectators that day, along with us in the news media. Now, one of the reasons for the huge crowd was that President Reagan was there to watch Columbia's landing as he stood in front of the space shuttle Enterprise with a bizarre blue carpet covering the wing for some unknown reason. Soon after Columbia arrived, the president gave the order for the 747 with the space shuttle Challenger on its back to take off on its trip to Florida to be prepared for its first launch on STS-6 in April 1983. Columbia returned yet again to Edwards at the end of STS-5 in November 82. I love this image that I shot as it shows the great expanse of the Rogers Lake bed, which gives a vehicle lots of room to maneuver upon landing. Once the spacecraft was safe, they towed it across the lake bed to the mate demate facility where she was processed for the ferry flight back to the Kennedy Space Center. This afforded many opportunities for a closer photographic inspection. On his sixth and final spaceflight, John Young brought Columbia back to Edwards at the completion of STS-9. It was late in the afternoon of 8 December 1983 when the shuttle landed, so that the shuttle was still being processed on the lake bed after dark. Here you can see the activity still happening inside the orbiter with the glow of the cockpit lights. Now, one of my favorite later missions was the landing of STS-58 10 years later in November 1993. A good friend of mine, astronaut pilot Rick Searfoss, was sitting in the right seat as Columbia touched down at 7.05 a.m. that morning. As you've seen, I tried to cover the shuttle well during my trips to Edwards, but the images were always looking at one side of the orbiter or the other as it flew by or was towed for processing. By this time, I was looking for something different. I knew they brought the vehicle past the Edwards control tower, so I set out to get permission to be on top of the tower this time when it happened. I met with some resistance, saying they couldn't figure out my, why I would want to do that. But I was determined, and I got up there. In this first image, Columbia is almost lost with all the F-16s, T-38s, and other miscellaneous aircraft parked near the hangars. But as she got closer, I was able to capture the sequence I wanted as it rolled by directly below. Others who came with me up the tower who had been skeptical soon understood why I was there and finally got it excited themselves to see Columbia from this new perspective. STS-93 marked the first mission to ever have a woman as the commander. Eileen Collins took Columbia onto orbit for the 26th time to deliver the Chandra X-ray Observatory to space. Just two months later, on 24 September 1999, Columbia arrived back in California at the start of a two-year-long major modification period, which included installing the new MEDS, or Multifunction Electronic Display Subsystem, more commonly known as the Glass Cockpit. I took this series of photos that day as Columbia was removed from the back of the shuttle carrier aircraft, lowered to the ground and moved inside the Boeing hangar in Palmdale, where it would be brought up to 21st century standards. It should also be noted here how the lineage of the shuttle changed over the years. When contracts were first signed, the company that built the orbiter was North American Rockwell. Several years later, it became Rockwell International, which was then assimilated by Boeing in 1996. Just six months later, on 27 March of 2000, I returned for an extraordinary day with Columbia. With me that day was my good friend, Jeff Howe. Our mission was to document Columbia as the refurbishment took place. Here a technician works on the thermal tiles on the belly of Columbia. And this is the exposed left wing flap mechanism. And here's the upper section of the vertical tail with the silts pod mounted to the top. This stood for the shuttle infrared lee side temperature sensing system, which measured the heat experienced by the Columbia during reentry. At the time of this modification, the actual sensor had been removed, but the pod was hopefully to be used for future experiments 
but they never occurred. And here I am looking down from the top of the tail to Columbia's left wing, about 50 feet below me. But beyond documenting the outside of the orbiter, this was a very special day in that Jeff and I were able to climb aboard Columbia and check her out from the inside as well. Before entry, we had to don head to toe bunny suits, as you can see, as I crawl through the tunnel leading through to the crew hatch. I'm on the left just after entering Columbia's mid deck. Al Hoffman holding my video camera on the right was our guide from Boeing. Jeff can be seen nearing the exit from the access tunnel in the center of the photo. Just behind the mid deck was the airlock leading into the cargo bay, but the hatch had been removed for refurbishment so we would have to enter the bay later through a different hatch in the cargo bay wall. But first it was time to climb up the ladder onto Columbia's flight deck. Most of the cockpit equipment had already been removed at this point, so the new glass cockpit could be installed. I'm sitting in the well that could, would be occupied by the pilot seat, looking across the center console into the commander's position. The cockpit windows are the black area behind me and have been blocked off to protect the multi-plane reinforced glass. We then had to exit the crew cabin in order to enter the cargo bay. Here we are passing camera equipment to Al through a hole in the left side forward fuselage, which is how we accessed the bay. Until that day, I never even knew there was such an access hatch on the side of the orbiter. Inside the cargo bay, you can see how all the floor coverings have been removed and catwalks put into place over the exposed underlying structure of the bay with wiring and conduits. Jeff and I sat in the cargo bay hatchway for an official portrait inside Columbia. Through that hole behind us is the orbiter crew module where we had just visited. This concluded our interior tour of Columbia. We returned 11 months later on 23 February 2001 for one last glimpse after all the modifications and upgrades had been completed. Columbia was being prepared for a cross-country flight back to the Kennedy Space Center in anticipation of future missions to space. Jeff and I with some friends took a last group shot with Columbia before she headed east. The orbiter would fly successfully just once more in March 2002 on STS-109, which was the fourth Hubble Space Telescope servicing mission. On 16 January 2003, Columbia launched with her crew of seven for a 16-day Space Hab science mission. It was to be Columbia's final flight. Reports said that even here in Southern California, we might be able to see Columbia's reentry in the pre-dawn sky. So Cherie and I, along with our friend Adrian, headed to a spot with a clear northern horizon, hoping to see the streak of the orbiter as she came back into the atmosphere. Unfortunately, it was not to be as Columbia traveled a bit too far north for us. But observers north of us at the Owens Valley Radio Observatory were able to shoot this beautiful time exposure as she headed toward landing in Florida. Unfortunately, Columbia never made it that far. After realizing we had missed seeing the reentry, we got back in the car and headed over to grab some breakfast. Listening to the radio, a report came in that said no one had heard any radio transmissions or received downlink from Columbia for more than 10 minutes. At that moment, the realization of what had just occurred hit me like a sledgehammer. I spun the car around out of the parking lot and headed home. Debris fell from the sky and one of the first images of that debris was the cargo bay hatch that Jeff and I had sat in that day for our photo. It was devastating and I can only imagine the anguish those who worked on Columbia every day must have felt in that moment knowing the orbiter and her seven crew members were gone. For myself, I prefer not to dwell on her ending, but on all the wonderful achievements Columbia accomplished in her 22 years of service to America's space program. And that is what we are here to celebrate today on this 40th anniversary of the first flight of the space shuttle Columbia. Noted surgeon and author Atul Gawande said, it isn't reasonable to ask that we achieve perfection. What is reasonable is to ask that we never cease to aim for it. 
Thank you for watching. I'll now turn it over to David Hitt so we can start our panel discussion. Wow. Okay, that's that's gonna be quite an act to follow. I have to say, I'm a I'm a little bit jealous. You know, <laughs> you know, a, 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 a little bit jealous. Wow, that's that's amazing. That's incredible experiences. Thank, Thank you, you so much for sharing that. Um, so yeah, let me uh, let me introduce the rest of the panel, and we will uh, we'll we'll dive into the, the Q and A part. Uh, with me today. Melvin Croft has over 40 years of experience. When I, when I say you're not, yeah, I was gonna say. So, so people can put faces to names, thank you. Melvin Croft has over 40 years of experience as a professional geologist with 27 years working in industry and 12 years teaching geology at a small college in Maine. He holds a BA and MS degree in geology from the University of South Florida and Florida State University. He's been an avid space fan since the beginnings of human spaceflight and is fortunate to have met many astronauts and cosmonauts. Mel, along with John Eustaskis, is present, uh, presently collaborating on another edition to the University of Nebraska Press Outward Odyssey book series, uh, which will uh, chronicle the story of extravehicular activity. They are the authors of Come Fly With Us, History of the, uh, the Payload Specialist Program. Francis French brings international experience in relating science, energy, engineering, music, astronomy, art, and wildlife to general audiences through classes, workshops, public speaking, television, and documentary productions. He is the author of numerous, numerous best-selling history books, including In the Shadow of the Moon for the Outward Odyssey series, and is an international keynote speaker at conferences, and just released his first children's book. So uh, if, you, uh, if you want to start, you know, if you, if you need a gateway drug to, uh, to get the children hooked on uh, Francis French early, it's, uh, it's now available. Chris Gaynor. Wave to him, Chris. There you go. <laughs> He's a uh, historian of technology and writer specializing in space exploration and aeronautics. He is the editor of Quest, the History of Spaceflight Quarterly, and is also the past president of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. He holds a PhD in the history of technology from the University of Alberta. His sixth book, Yet Not Yet Imagined, a study of Hubble Space Telescope Operations, has just been published by the NASA History Program Office. His book, To a Distant Day, The Rocket Pioneers, was published in 2008 as part of the Outward Odyssey series. Jay Gallantine focuses his space research on unmanned lunar and planetary programs of the United States and former Soviet Union. He's, best, uh, he's known for deep dives into narrow topics, relatable explanations of technology, and for his lively public presentations. Jay has published two books in the Outward Odyssey series, Ambassadors from Earth, and Infinity Beckoned, Adventuring Through the Inner Solar System, a third is on the way. Jeffrey Bowman, there we go, is a uh, retired lawyer who lives with his wife Sandra in Belfast, Northern Ireland. He spent many years defending mainly uh, shipyard asbestos claims, which usually involve calculating the size of settlements, <laughs> a lifelong space enthusiast. Jeffrey just about remembers the flight of Yuri Gagarin and Island Shepard and has many fond and vivid memories of the Apollo missions. He finally got to see a Saturn launch, the Apollo Soyuz launch in July 1975. Having contributed two chapters to Outward Odyssey's Footprints in the Dust, Jeffrey has submitted to the manuscript for his first complete book, a biography of Apollo 17, Ron Evans. Um, this says working title, but we can now say no longer working title, actual title, A Long Voyage to the Moon. It will be coming out this fall. Um, which is due to be published, oh, which is due to be published later this year, specifically later this fall. Uh, his research included a 2019 meeting with Ron's widow, Jan Evans, and their daughter, Jamie, in Scottsdale, Arizona. Also with us today, Jay Claddick is a spaceflight historian. Wave, Jay. There we go. All right. <laughs> Can't follow directions. Is a his spaceflight historian and a regular contributor to the online forum Collect Space. In his Outward Odyssey volume, Outposts on the Frontier, here, Claddock documents the historical tapestry of the people, the early attempts at space shuttle, space station, space station programs, and how astronauts and engineers have contributed to and shaped the ISS in surprising ways. I'm your host, David Hitt. I'm the author of Homesteading Space, the Skylab Story, and Bold They Rise, <laughs> thank you, Bold They Rise, the, uh, the space shuttle early years for the, uh, for the Outward Odyssey series. And uh, if my esteemed colleagues are ready, let's, uh, let's just jump right in. I'm gonna go in order that you appear on my screen in hopes that that will help me not mess it up this time. So uh, Michelle, you're in the, uh, you're the, the, the top, top square for, uh, for my little uh, uh, $64,000 pyramid here. <laughs> 
that said, I will let I will let you choose whether you want to answer or pass on this question. What was your experience with STS one? Uh, did you watch it? Uh, do you have any memories about the launch or beginning of the program leading up to it? Stand out. Do you uh, anything else you want to add, or or do you want me to uh, to pass it on to Jay? Uh, no, I, I had no idea what was going on. I slept through the whole thing. Um, <laughs> Uh, I would say I had as much excitement about the upcoming launch of STS-1, waiting for that was almost as exciting as waiting for Apollo 11 to get off the pad and so many more, especially being the first new launch, you know, a new system. And just this idea of seeing a vehicle with the crew cabin stuck on the side instead of on top was just a really weird thing to see. And all I could see was how tiny those struts were that were holding the orbiter to the side of the external tank. And it's like, there's no way in the universe that thing's gonna stay on there during launch. So it was, it was a very trepidatious time to say the least. Uh, other than that, I'll, I'll pass it along to these other wonderful authors who are here today. All right, uh, Mr. Platic, what you got? Well, um, let's see. see. Seeing SCS one was rather interesting. A uh, li little bit of factoid about myself: although I was really big into watching the shuttle at age ten, uh, I was on a boy. I was on a Cub Scout camp out that day, and my dad. Uh, he had a little black and white television set in the camper he was in, but me being in, in the tent at the time, he decided not to wake me up. I don't know. Maybe he thought because, because he didn't think this thing was going to go off either, maybe he didn't want me to see the horror of a, of a rocket launch going bad. So, But after it flew, I kind of said, Dad, you should have woke me up. He goes, I know. But I, I remember uh, going home what uh devouring every bit of video i could on that thing and uh oh basically uh holding my collective breath with the rest of the world when they opened the payload bay doors and you saw tiles missing off the top of the ohms pods but uh things did did go through um a little bit later i'd like to uh kind of after some of the some of our other panelists have had a chance to make some comments i've got a little presentation that talks about Columbia's pop culture influences at the time, even though it's not necessarily engineering related, it'll give us a nice little chance to look back at the way things were and kind of chuckle a little at some of the weird products that came out back in those days. Let's unmute. And then let's uh, let's plan on this question a little later on about the uh, about the legacy, and uh, so maybe we can pull that out when we uh, when we get to that one. Mr. Bowman, any uh, any recollections? Yes, um, it had been nearly six years since Apollo Soyuz, a six-year desert with no launches, and uh, by the time we were getting towards the launch of STS-1, I was ready for it. I was salivating. Here was another launch with astronauts, and uh, it seemed like the dream was starting to reignite. And, uh, but the, the problem was that I think we had all been spoiled during the Apollo years by the precision of Apollo launches. Every single Apollo launch took off on the day, well, with the slight exception of Apollo 17, it was the other side of midnight, but no Apollo launch was scrubbed on launch day. Two small delays, that was it. Apollo launches took off on time. So I just assumed that STS-1 would take off as advertised on the 10th of April. So I had booked uh, a trip with my girlfriend to London on the 14th of April. And so I sat down to watch the launch on the 10th of April, uh, entirely satisfied that the launch would take place because NASA said it would. And of course we know what happened, scrub. Um, so I, I was really quite concerned about this, not just because of the astronauts sitting up there on the, on the vehicle, uh, the launch scrub, but uh, I was beginning to wonder about my plans collapsing. And uh, when I eventually saw the launch on the 12th of April, 
was a fantastic and wonderful experience that I will never forget seeing that amazing looking vehicle taking off. And it was so different to a Saturn. But once uh, Columbia had taken off and had safely made it into orbit, I started thinking about the impact on, on my own plans. The 14th of April should have been the day that I was glued to the TV set, watching every second of the coverage of Columbia's crucial re-entry and landing. And at the time when Columbia was coming back through the atmosphere, I was in a car driving towards the ferry port. And instead of watching on TV, I had to make do with a crackly radio. So I did at least hear the landing. But um, I did say to my girlfriend, you know, there is no other person on the planet who could have stopped me watching live coverage of this thing coming into land. And uh, so I always remember, that's my personal recollection of the landing of Columbia. I never saw it live. I only listened on the radio. And uh, well, uh, I, we lasted another five months, but then we broke up. But uh, at that time, life intervened and I didn't get to see the land in the night. That's it. All right, thanks for sharing. JG. Yes, sir. Um, I, I watched it live and I was incredibly excited because I was already a space buff at that point. And I felt like I had missed everything because I'm, I'm practically the same age as Jay Kalotic. You know, we're, we're both just over 50. And so totally missed Apollo. Was, was too young for Skylab or Apollo Soyuz. And at the age of nine, I was kind of feeling like I had already been born 10 years too late. But here was going to be my generation space program. Uh, I had been indoctrinated in the propaganda. I had been to the bookstore and, you know, been reading all these books that had all these amazing foldouts and all of the things inside of the shuttle and stuff. And I was super excited. Hadn't actually read it, mostly was just looking at the pictures. Had no real appreciation for the people who were on board even, uh, or all of the engineering work that had gone into this, uh, but, but just knew that it was gonna be my generation space program. And took off, dropped the solids, goes up into orbit. And then for me, it was like, okay, what now? Because previously it was watching videos about Apollo and after you watched the video of the launch, then you would see the films of them in orbit. And uh, it, was, it was kind of a bummer understanding in my little nine-year-old brain, okay, they're up in orbit now, this is happening right now. And for the next pictures and videos, <coughs> you're going to have to wait. Um, but then two days later, got to, got to see the landing again, live in real time and, and I was in love. I was instantly in love with the show. All right, thank you. Uh, Chris. Well, uh, I'm kind of an older fossil. I can remember watching Mercury flights, um, although I was very young back then. And, uh, and, and when Apollo 11 landed on the moon, I actually won some money. I bet somebody years before that, uh, that the Americans would make it before the Russians. So, uh, um, so the shuttle came along, we'd had the long drogue and I kind of lived through that drogue by really getting into the Soviet space program as much as I could. And, uh, but I was excited about it and, and I was quite surprised at how much general excitement there was uh, about this, the, uh, the shuttle. So uh, on the morning of April 10th, uh, I got up in my home in Vancouver, uh, in the west coast of Canada, and it was four in the morning. Of course, it was scrubbed. And uh, by the time it was launched 48 hours and three seconds later, I was in a fancy hotel room in Toronto. So uh, that was nice. And I watched the, uh, the uh, landing in a bar uh, at a conference I was going to in a small town in Ontario. Um, up here in Canada, the excitement was actually perhaps even greater for the second flight, uh, STS-2, because it was the first that had the uh, uh, Canada Arm or Space Shuttle Remote Manipulator System on board. 
And uh, that was a successful test of that, which got a, a great deal of, of coverage here. And then finally, the following year, I was down at the Cape for uh, STS-5, which, uh, which was a, a wonderful experience. So uh, I got plenty to say about the shuttle, but I'll leave it for other questions. All right, thank you. Francis. Well, I wanna say I don't like this. I, I don't like the fact that my whole life there's been people saying, you missed the Apollo area, you, you know, you, you young kids with the shuffle. Now we're talking about a 40 year anniversary. I mean, 40 years ago, that's like, you know, Woodstock or something. That's not in the 1980s. That's not the space shuttle. All of a sudden we've become like the old guards of this stuff. This is crazy. But um, having said that, I'm glad we are here to celebrate this. And I, not only do I remember where it was, I have evidence. I have an audio cassette. Remember these things? Audio because I went to school for the first launch, took this with me, stuck my audio cassette next to the television, you know, the old television on the, they trundled out into the middle of the, the assembly hall and kept watching that red light, making sure it was on as this thing got scrubbed because computers weren't talking to each other. Um, the, the English television um, coverage was exceptional and really good. Um, by the time it actually went, I'm in my front room back home really upset that my mother is not coming out of the kitchen to come watch this thing with me because even though I didn't know a huge amount about space, I knew that this was historic. Um, the great thing about listening to an audio cassette, not only you can hear the coverage, but I can hear my reaction to this thing. And I was thinking over the years, you know, I was probably an excited little kid and she probably came out, you know, 10 minutes before and I'd been like all anxious. No, listening to this cassette, she comes out 45 seconds before the launch, at which point I am absolutely losing my mind, wondering when is she going to come out of the kitchen and watch this thing with me. Um, so I have, you know, wonderful memories of that and I can actually literally replay them. I'm just digitizing this thing right now. Um, so I got very, very excited about the, the, the program at the time and it really is our generation's space program, just as other people have that Apollo memories. Not only is this our generation's program, but we grew up to watch this thing retire at which point people younger than us have flown the thing. So, I mean, this, this is literally an entire multi-generational thing. Um, talking to John Young and Bob Crippen later in, in life as I interviewed them for some of this stuff, you know, I, only then did I realize what a dangerous mission this was, how much, watching the footage at the time, I'm listening to them describe, here come the solid rocket boosters come off, the external tanks coming off, and that, thinking about this now going, this is the first time they ever did this. This is not uh, something that had been tested it couldn't be tested without people on board. And I really think of the bravery of those guys on there. And to talk later to John Young in his very droll, dry way, as he describes being the commander of this mission and just how risky this was. And as a test pilot, just how he was okay with like, this might not go okay. He, he didn't want that to happen. He was doing everything he could to survive, but he was ready for it all to just go disastrously wrong that day. And that's sobering. I, I think about my excitement as a 10 year old. And then I think about the realities those two were facing. And this was one of the most dangerous things that ever happened in human spaceflight ever. Very much. Thank you. Melvin. I was a lucky kid. I was born in Florida, not that far from the space, from the Cape. And uh, it was all over the news, TV, um, newspapers. So I was all into it. Um, I'd follow Mercury, Jimmy, Apollo, and it wasn't unusual to watch a launch on TV in about 10 seconds before liftoff, run outside and watch it. Kind of neat. And, but like Jeffrey said, after ASTP, nothing for six years. So my response to STS-1 was one of relief. It was really finally the future's here and the shuttle didn't disappoint. Thank you. So uh, you may have noticed during that round of questions um, per with perfect timing, uh, Mr. Colin Burgess has joined us. He is the, uh, the reason that we are all here, the, uh, the architect of the Outward Odyssey series. I have to point out that the, uh, the, the Outward Odyssey series now, the sun never sets on the Outward Odyssey empire. We have authors around the world. It is daylight somewhere above one of the authors at any given moment. Um, I mentioned that because it is early in the morning for, uh, for Colin. So we appreciate you, uh, you getting up and, uh, and joining us for this. Uh, Mr. Colin Burgess is a prolific author who has written over 30 books on the subject of human space exploration and whose titles include 
Selecting the Mercury 7, The Search for America's First Astronauts, Teacher in Space, Krista McAuliffe and the Challenger Legacy, Fallen Astronauts, and most recently, Shattered Dreams. Residing in Sydney, Australia, and a familiar face at many past Space Fest gatherings, Burgess has also served for the past 17 years as founder and series editor for the University of Nebraska's ongoing Outward Odyssey series of books, tasked with locating and mentoring new space flight authors and guiding them through the publication process. As of uh, by the end of this year, the series will be at 20 books with, I believe Colin said the other day, eight more um, that are already in work. This is without question the uh, most complete, most complex, most, uh, most impressive series in, on spaceflight history. If there's ever anything about anything related to space um, that you wanna know about, um, there probably is a book in the series about it. Um, if you want a really deep dive, th that book is coming. Um, so uh, <laughs> thank you so much for, uh, for joining us today, Colin. Um, the question, we're still on our first question, which has been, um, what are your, uh, what are your memories of STS-1? So, welcome. Colin, you're muted. We, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Okay, yes, thank you very much for that very muted introduction. Uh, you talked about the sun setting. Well, the sun hasn't risen here. It's, it's coming up uh, quarter to six in the morning. Uh, I, I sort of got things wrong a little while back when I looked up what time it would start in uh, Australian time, uh, East Coast Australian time, uh, it was six o'clock. What I hadn't factored in was that we've just gone off down at saving. It's now, uh, the meeting started at five o'clock uh, Sydney time. But I'm, I'm armed with a cup of coffee. I'm starting to get my voice. So I'm going to uh, answer your question. Uh, but first of all, thank you very much for that introduction. And uh, what you said is very, very true about the Outward Odyssey series. It's been a spectacular success, uh, far exceeding anything that I thought would happen when we first embarked on this, uh, which was going to be a series of eight books. And uh, as the series progressed, I kept seeking out new authors. And the thing about the series today is that authors are coming to me with ideas, which I'm passing through to the University of Nebraska Press. And it, it's been a revelation, uh, not only for me, but I guess in a way the uh, space flight fraternity that they've had this opportunity to not only participate in writing books, but for the general population out there to read these books. But uh, you talked about the space shuttle at the beginning. Uh, in 1981, 40 years ago, I was actually on a basing in London with my airline Qantas uh, as a member of the Qantas cabin crew. And our basing was coming to an end. Pretty well starved of uh, information about space flight over there because Skylab had finished so many years before, and there was this hiatus. All we were getting was information about what was coming up. And I can recall getting more and more excited as I started seeing information about the shuttle being developed and constructed. And then we started seeing the selection of a whole new cadre of astronauts specifically selected to fly on the space shuttle. Then we started seeing the SCA drops, the shuttle endeavor mounted on top of the SCA aircraft, the piggybacking on the, that 747. And slowly we were approaching launch time. I was trying to save as many London papers as I could with information, but I do recall being home when SDS-1 launched into the skies. It was uh, magic it had been too long eight years we've been waiting for another space flight to happen and uh, here it was and suddenly i was nervous i was truly nervous watching the countdown to this flight uh, it's it's an unforgettable memory and uh, such relief when they finally announced that the shuttle columbia was in orbit that's my recollection Thank you for sharing. 
I, uh, and I, I will say this year, the anniversary for me, um, in addition to being, you know, the, the 40th, one of the, the big zero anniversaries is a, uh, is a special one. Um, so I, you know, we were talking beforehand, I'm, I'm the baby of the panel. Um, I was born two weeks, two weeks after Apollo Soyuz landed. So I missed the Apollo era by two weeks. I mean, not that I would have had any memories of, you know, if I'd been a month earlier, but, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, there's, there's a very real, you know, the story of Apollo ends and the story of David begins. Uh, but that means that I was five years old for, uh, for the first launch. I was old enough that, uh, you know, that my dad could grab me and, and, and put me in the TV put me in the TV, put me in front of the TV. That was probably a uh, help there. We don't, don't want to start any rumors here. Uh, put me in front of the TV. And, and we watched that together. And honestly, at this point, I would be lying if I had said I had really strong memories of, of watching that launch versus, you know, was it this launch, was it that launch? Um, but, you know, what I do know is I've got a, a story that I wrote, you know, a year or two later in, in elementary school about a, a science fiction story about how uh, in the year 1999, John Young was gonna go back into space on a new rocket and, uh, and you know, Columbia was gonna have to go up and save him. And, uh, you know, just all these little, all these little milestones from childhood where, where that moment, where that one moment that, uh, that my dad took me and put me in front of the TV and we watched this thing together, um, you know, had a lasting impact. You know, I mean, the, the, this little book right here, you know, is, is because, you know, my uh, my dad took his five year old son and put him in front of the TV and uh, and said, you know, let's let's watch this thing. That you know, I'm, I'm out here today because of that moment. And so, this year, you know, is the anniversary is not only the uh, the fortieth, but um, you know, I've, I've got a sixteen month old son. And uh, and as we're looking forward to, uh, you know, I'm I'm I am hoping I'm I'm not giving up hope that uh, that are, when he's around the age that I was for STS one. Um, you know, I'm going to put him in front of the TV and we're going to watch, um, you know, the, the first woman and the next man walk on the surface of the moon. And, uh, and it's just, you know, seeing the impact that that moment had in my life is, is a real, uh, you know, a real charge, a real um, uh, conviction, you know, for, uh, for me as, as a parent now with, uh, with my own son, to, uh, you know, to, to, to stir those memories. Um, you know, Michelle talked about the, uh, the delay. Um, the uh, the delay of STS one is one of my uh, my two favorite delays in all of spaceflight history because I, I you know again wasn't personally affected by it I watched on the TV just fine on the uh, on the twelfth but uh, but I love 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 that uh, that because of that delay I mean I'm I'm thinking the computers conspired like they did it on purpose they knew what the uh, what date it was and uh, you know if we just waited two more days like if we pushed off to uh, to April twelfth we could be right there on the uh, on the anniversary of uh, of, uh, of Vostok, of uh, Yuri Gagarin making this first space flight. And so I love that, um, you know, the, the, that synchronicity. We had the same thing happen many years back with, uh, with October 4th, which is the beginning of, uh, of the space age and the beginning of the, the commercial space age with the launch of uh, Sputnik and the launch of Spaceship One uh, overlapping on the same day. Um, but I'm really grateful to this panel that, uh, that of these two huge anniversaries that are taking place Monday, um, we're here to talk about my favorite. So. Uh, <laughs> So, so thank you for uh, for agreeing to come and join me for a uh, for a shuttle panel. Um, jumping just because I want to I want to kind of book into the whole thing so that we can kind of talk about the context in between. Um, jumping way to the other end of the program, um, memories of STS one thirty five. Do you uh, do you have recollections of uh, of where you were around the uh, the end of the program or or thoughts about that side that uh, that stand out, Michelle? Uh, well, first of all, just to show how young you are, you said you're a couple weeks younger than Apollo Soyuz. I am 19 days younger than Disneyland. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so anyway, with, with that thought, um, yeah, STS-135 does not have certainly the... Uh, impact on my memories as STS-1 did and some of the other missions, um, you know, or winding down the program. Uh, it was definitely what we would call an anticlimax. Everything perf went perfectly well on STS-135, which was good. We really did like the fact that it ended the way that it did. Um, so yeah, it, it definitely does not stand out in my memories as it did for the first one. 
but I also feel that it was something that could have been continued uh, if they had done certain things. There were so many uh, studies about upgrading the shuttle, correcting the flaws that we knew were there in the shuttle from the beginning, and just feel it would have been really nice if they'd just gone in and upgraded the program, fixed the things, fixed the flaws, and moved on with that program. Uh, and it probably would have been a heck of a lot cheaper and it would have gotten us back into orbit a lot sooner than we have gotten there. So uh, yeah, would have, would have loved to have seen that. But yeah, other than that, not any really specific memories, just saying, wow, I wish we'd done this a little different and we might still be flying today in some form. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kladdick. Yes. Well, for 135, because uh, I was working on a little book at the time, I was able to get uh, press pass to attend that. And actually, that was, I think, my my fourth total launch at KSC. I I, I saw I I saw Discovery second reflight. I saw STS 131, which was the last night launch of the program, and 135 and. I told myself I was not going to miss that one because that was the final one. I knew the crowds were going to be big. Uh, and even when I uh, got to the area a few days earlier, I had actually gone over to like a space view park in Titusville where people were actually starting to uh, gather and set up their campgrounds and stuff. And I even took one of those people out to, uh, to a local Walmart so we could pick up some supplies and stuff before heading back. Cause I don't know if you've been to Titusville, it's like the Walmart is like clear on the West side of town and space view park is as far East as you can get in Titusville. Cause after that, you got the big, uh, the big expanse of water and you get a nice view of uh, pads 39 a and B and the VAB. But um, when I, when I saw that bird launch, I did not know it was going to affect me as much as it did emotionally. I mean, I I broke out tears of joy and just crying. A news crew actually did did uh, a cameraman actually did uh, shoot footage of of me and interviewed me after, and he said that I was overcome. And I said, "Yeah, because." I don't know what the future of the program is going to be like now that this is ending. I mean, you got, there's a lot of people here in this area that are going to be out of work from this because we have no idea how long it's going to be before we fly another one. And it just, it just seemed weird that for 30 years we had shuttle and then we had nothing. And it was just, what is the future going to bring? We didn't know at that point. I mean, now we, we're, we're closer to uh, seeing SLS fly. We've had uh, Crew Dragon flying. We've got Starliner flying. Uh, and then we got my personal favorite, which is the uh, the Dream Chaser, which should be going up in a couple of years. I mean, hey, lifting bodies, getting back to the old $6 million man days and back to what the promise of shuttle was. So, but yeah, it was, it was a fun and interesting time. I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much, Jeffrey. Uh, I saw the uh, the launch live on TV. Uh, I saw the landing live on TV, and parts of the mission are probably mostly on the news. And uh, generally, it was a feeling of delight and relief that the crew were safe when they landed safely. Um, that the that the series of shuttle missions had ended safely and successfully, but um, there was an overwhelming sense of melancholy. The shuttle had landed in darkness and frankly the, the spotlight wasn't enough really to illuminate it particularly well. And it just seemed to be a metaphor for the long nine year hiatus of darkness in, in spaceflight after that. Um, so basically a sense of relief at the safe return of the crew, the melancholy that this was the end of a 30 year period of uh, shuttle flights. 
Thank you. Jay? Well, I, I have to tell you, I, I did not watch the launch or the landing of the last one. I couldn't tell you exactly when it happened, and I couldn't tell you who flew on it. I was in the middle of writing uh, my second book, and uh, it wasn't a near panic or anything like that, but I, I basically had dropped everything else and was just completely focusing on the material in my book. But what I do remember is hearing that this was going to be the last shuttle launch. And having been there to see the first one, I can remember feeling incredibly disappointed and sharing basically the same thing that Michelle was just talking about in terms of, don't you just about have all the kinks worked out of it? It, it seems like at this point, it should be hitting its stride. And there had been these alternate concepts of the shuttle C, which would be using the same launch system. And it, it just seemed like not yesterday, but in the very recent past that these had only just started flying. And what do you mean we're gonna close it down? Uh, and I can remember thinking, why? And I, I'm still not understanding of why exactly they, they decided to shut it down, uh, but I was just incredibly disappointed. I, uh, well that, I think you speak for a lot of folks with, <laughs> with that. Uh, Chris. Uh, the thing I, I remember about the, uh, the, the last flight is that I was uh, following it a lot on, uh, on my computer and social media. And uh, so that was a change, you know, from the old black and white uh, TVs and newspapers and the, that I, all we had, say, back in the, the pre-shuttle days. But even, even at the beginning of the shuttle program, there really wasn't an internet or anything like that. And, uh, and I was reminded of that again when I was working on my Hubble book, some of the, uh, some of the information on the earlier flights was uh, a little harder to find because it was in the pre-internet era, the pre-digital era. So, uh, um, and I do remember that flag uh, they had, which was uh, uh, flown on STS-1 and they left, I believe they left it in the station on that flight. And of course it was uh, recently uh, picked up on the uh, Dragon last year. So, um, yeah, uh, you know, Jay uh, got into an interesting point. Of course, uh, I, I felt sad about that. You know, uh, 30 years is a, is a long time. There was a lot of things that were uh, uh, achieved and learned in, in the shuttle program. But uh, I, I, I guess uh, I'm gonna be a bit of a stick in the mud. I'm one of these people who sort of saw, well, uh, you know, this, this, this was almost inevitable. I, I can't say I felt that back in 1981, but as time went on, you know, there was a lot of compromises and changes made to the shuttle in the 1970s to save a few bucks in the 1970s that just came back and, 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 and cost and cost and cost and cost, you know, the, the shuttle was supposed to be fully reusable. It was only to save a few bucks in the seventies. It was only partially reusable, so it it failed to meet the promise, uh, one of the promises, and also kind of the the flight rate thing. I think we only ever had more than nine flights in a year, and you know back uh, back in the seventies we were thinking, oh well, it's just going to fly like you know a, a seven three seven or something like that. And, uh, and that didn't happen. And I think that kind of doomed it, you know, along with the, the safety issues that cost two crews. Uh, so, um, you know, uh, I'm very, very sad. I was very sad about it. And today uh, I might get into this in another question. I'm not sure whether what was achieved in the shuttle program has been properly acknowledged, but anyway, there we have it. Thank you, Francis. What I really remember about the last ones is how much the Kennedy Space Center workforce was still working like this was gonna go on forever, their enthusiasm, their teamwork, knowing that some of them were gonna get laid off. I was in um, 
But by this time, you know, I'm 10 years old when I see the first one. By now, I've seen Columbia launch. I've had a payload flown on Columbia on its very last successful mission to the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, I'm invested, you know, I've, I've, and um, I know some of these people who are flying these missions, and I'm in the orbiting, orbital processing facility for what is um, supposed to be the last shuttle getting prepared to fly. You know, they did add another mission, but, and I'm looking at some of the engineers, they are messing with the shuttle tiles underneath this in, immense orbiter, like putting ever so slight different changes um, in, there's little bumps on some of these tiles to make sure the aerodynamics are slightly different so that they can get different test data. And I'm, I'm talking to the, um, the supervisor and I'm saying, you know, almost like why, you know, because it's gonna give you some general information, but why more shuttle stuff? And it's like, we're still going right up to the end. Everything we can learn from this vehicle is gonna tell us about new vehicles. It's gonna tell us about what happens next. We're gonna learn. And it really impressed me because I mean, had I been one of those engineers, I may have been a little depressed that this was all coming to an end. And there was that feeling of melancholy that people have talked about. Um, but these people were there right to the end. And uh, that was, that, that impressed me more than anything. Um, Isaac Asimov was asked to write a short story when the first shuttle launched, the Columbia one we're celebrating today, and it was called The Last Shuttle Mission or The Last Shuttle Launch. And it's just a short story and it's supposed to be, well, what happens at the end of the program? And it's uh, hopeful. And uh, yeah, the, the feeling was not hopeful around that time, but uh, I, have to, I have to say I was, I was so impressed by the teamwork I saw going on because there wasn't a replacement. And I think that's just... Uh, we're all, we're all feeling that. Why cancel something? Why end something when you don't have the next one? You know, I know David has done some incredible work on the next generation and it wasn't ready yet because they weren't giving you enough funding, you know? So it was like, can we have the next one first before we retire this one? So really, really mixed feelings. It was probably time for the shuttle to retire, but let's have the next vehicle ready first. Thank you. Mr. Croft. I'm kind of aligned with Chris. I mean, I would love to see the shuttle keep flying. I love the thing, uh, but it's probably the right decision, a difficult decision for NASA to make. Um, but the reality was the monies that would have been required to keep it flying were needed elsewhere for the future. And my co-author John, he points out that he feels the shuttle was flying on borrowed time. Even after 30 years of flying, it was still an experimental spacecraft. And had we kept launching, I mean, the odds are we would have seen another major disaster and, and we didn't need that. So while maybe a, a tough decision, it was the right decision, I think that the only unfortunate thing that came from that decision that it was, what, nine years before we were able to launch our own astronauts into space again. So I'd like to see a little bit better coordination there if, if NASA were somehow to call me up and ask my opinion. That's what I'd tell them. Well, uh, I'll put in a good word. I, <laughs> Colin, any, uh, any recollections of the end of the program? Yeah, I was just listening to everybody talking about uh, their age and uh, where they were and how old they were. Uh, I was born five months before Chuck Yeager through the sound barrier. So uh, that puts me in a rather senior position here. But uh, I'd also like to apologize. The uh, caffeine is now kicking in. So to those pedants out there, I do know that it was Enterprise that was involved in the SAC tests, uh, the seven. Four, seven, and I also managed to skip over the Apollo Soyuz mission in 1975. So my apologies for that, but I'm now stable. Uh, my nurse will be coming in very shortly to uh, take care of me. But my memories of STS-135, uh, probably not as dynamic as when the Apollo program finished. Uh, that to me was a, a very tearful event because I'd seen spaceflight evolve through the Sputnik, right through to Gene Cernan being the last man on the moon. Uh, I must admit that the shuttle program did not mean as much to me as the earlier programs, and uh, I apologize for that. But I do recall some of the momentous things that happened during the shuttle program, and it was coming to an end. I do recall them announcing that uh, SDS-135 would be the final flight in the series and it came upon us very quickly suddenly they were launching STS-135 and then we witnessed the landing the nighttime landing and uh, that very familiar wheels stop announced the end of the 
space shuttle program. Again, is this hiatus where we were totally reliant on the Russians taking Americans into space, but that's all about to change. And uh, I will say that I've just finished writing and it will very soon be published a new book for another publisher, for which I apologize, but it encompasses the entire story of human space exploration. And the beauty of it is that it will be published before the next phase of space life. So I've seen an ending in this book. We're about to see a beginning. And hopefully there's going to be a new uh, group of writers out there that will start tackling these new projects that we're seeing evolve. Uh, even as we sit here, things are happening. Things are getting exciting. Uh, the shuttle was a wonderful program. We did so much with that, but it's finished. Let's get on with getting people back into space again and doing all those incredible things that we're getting so used to doing. Thank you. I, uh, for, uh, for STS-135, I had just wrapped up about eight and a half years as a, uh, as a NASA, as a contractor supporting NASA education. One of my, uh, one of my duties was writing a uh, story for teachers and students about every shuttle mission um, as they were coming up. And so I, uh, my last day was actually shortly before STS-135. I had written the article. That was one of my, you know, before I leave, I get to write the story. I get to, you know, to, to finish the course uh, about the last shuttle mission. Got that finished, had my last day. Um, was not going to miss that launch. Drove down to Florida. Um, when I was working as a, uh, as a contractor at Marshall Space Flight Center, I was able to go and, and see several launches from on site at, uh, at Kennedy Space Center. I had, you know, for, at 135, lost my, uh, lost my superpowers, lost my access. So I was uh, across the river in Titusville as well. I was at, uh, at Rotary Park instead of Riverside, Jay. So, uh, so that's why I didn't see you. But uh, it was, uh, of all the launches that I see, saw in person down there, um, the worst. Um, and just purely because there was, uh, there was low cloud cover that day. So from where I was standing, there was about two degrees maybe off the horizon between the launch pad and the clouds. So I, I, I had driven down, I, you know, I didn't fly down, I drove down, um, had made the trek down there, um, sat on the, uh, the riverside for I don't know how many hours for, uh, for this historic occasion. And, uh, you know, and, and the, the moment comes, T0, the engine's light, and oh, there it went. Um, and so it was, uh, like I said, the, 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 from a, just from an experience standpoint, from a, a visual standpoint, the least impressive launch that I saw. But oh gosh, from an emotional standpoint, um, yeah, you know, I mean, none of them were, uh, uh, 125. I had the, the the final level servicing mission. I had the best seat of any of them. I was, you know, I was, I was close enough that you could read the, uh, the, you know, the name on the side of the bird with a decent pair of binoculars. Um, but even so, you know, emotionally didn't hold a candle to uh, to, to that launch. Watching uh, watching shuttle leave Earth for the final time. I, um, if I recall correctly, I, I think I watched the landing on my phone. I think I was, you know, do, doing this. I forget what I was, you know, I was in the middle of something, but I'm not going to miss it. So, you know, so that's my, the actual end of the shuttle program was, uh, was this, um, you know, my, my memory of, of 135, the, my memory of the, the, the end of the program is always going to be rooted much more in that moment at the, uh, the Riverside and Titusville than the, uh, the actual landing. Um, and yeah, you know, a, a lot of those mixed emotions, you know, I am now looking back with the benefit of, of 10 years of hindsight. Um, like I said, this moon thing, like I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, uh, I'm kind of optimistic. I'm kind of hopeful. I'm kind of excited about this moon thing. Like, like if we do that, that would be cool. You know, I mean, all the, the, the all the old folks on the panel that talked about how great it was to uh, <laughs> watch the moon landing. I want that, right? You know, I mean like, hey, let's, let's do it again, right? Um, and so if this is what it takes, you know, if, if, if what it means that, that we have to give up to, uh, to have people on the, uh, on the moon again, uh, you know, what we have to give up to have, you know, people working in Earth orbit, people in, working in lunar orbit, people working on the surface of the moon, all at the same time is we give up shuttle. 
man, that's a Faustian trait, but I'll take it. But, uh, but that doesn't mean that, man, I don't miss that thing. You know, I, I went down for, uh, for crew two, for, uh, for crew one rather, the, uh, uh, you know, the, the dragon launch back in November. And, and, and it was nice, you know, I mean, like, don't get me wrong, <laughs> but, uh, but man, I, I miss shuttle. Um, let's see. Okay. So Colin mentioned his, uh, his upcoming book. We've talked about some of the, uh, some of the others. Um, I will, I will take a moment to say I was fortunate enough, blessed enough to, uh, to read an advanced copy of, uh, of Colin's upcoming book. Um, I've been asked a lot and I see online discussions a lot. If I, I, I want to know everything about space flight history, but I only want to read one book. Uh, <laughs> What should it be? <laughs> and uh, and if you're looking for that one book, if that's you, um, the greatest adventure by uh, by Colin Burgess is that one book. Now again, like I talked about, uh, Francis's children's book being the uh, the gateway drug for kids. Um, the greatest adventure will be the uh, the gateway drug that'll get you hooked in the rest of the series. So I'm not worried about promoting him over the rest of us because uh, you'll come around. Trust me. But um, but while we're on the topic of shameless promotion, we've got authors here with uh, with books representing a, uh, a variety of topics, um, you know, Mind Bold, They Rise, um, History of the Shuttle Program from Inception through Challenger. So it's tied to, uh, to what, <laughs> thank you, Francis, to, uh, to what we're talking about today is, uh, is kind of obvious. Um, when we, uh, you know, when we talk about some of the others, you know, okay, what, is, what, is, what does this have to do with, uh, with shuttle? How does it connect? But we're at a point where, um, you know, shuttle history is half of, uh, of human spaceflight history at this point, right? And, um, so, uh, you know, it, it, it kind of has a lot of tendrils. So I just kind of wanted to, uh, to go around and let each of the authors kind of uh, have a moment of shameless promotion to uh, talk about how their book uh, relates to, uh, to why we're here today. So, uh, uh, you know, Michelle, yours is kind of a, uh, a softball. I think there's a little bit of a tie between, uh, <laughs> between the book and the topic. So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll let you start. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, yeah, there's a, a little bit of connection there. Uh, just to do my own shameless promotion here, the X-15 rocket plane. Um, I guarantee, personally guarantee, good reads by everybody. Uh, if not, you can drop me an email and we'll discuss it. Um, yeah, the, uh, the space shuttle owes a lot to the X-15. Uh, without the X-15, we would not have had the space shuttle that we did. Uh, one of the biggest things was the fact that for the 199 missions of the X-15, they had 90 you know, seconds or so of powered flight. And after that, it was an unpowered uh, ballistic glider uh, landing on the lake bed, totally unpowered. And yet they were able to set that thing down within feet of where they intended to set it down. And when the space shuttle was in its original design phases, uh, all these guys were saying, oh, we need to put these jet engines, we're going to mount these jet engines uh, on the space shuttle so that after it re-enters, we can just pop these things out in pods or something and spool up those engines and then we can go fly around wherever we want to fly, uh, landing at LAX or wherever. And uh, uh, Mel Thompson, uh, X-15 pilot number nine, actually went down to Johnson Space Center to set them all straight and said, putting those uh, jet engines on the space shuttle will not only uh, unduly complicate things, uh, probably leading to more catastrophe actually, uh, it will also cut down your payload and everything else. So get rid of the damn things and look at what we've offered you with the X-15. We've shown you how to make precision landings coming down from spaceflight. And uh, uh, Milt was down there a couple of weeks, but he finally swayed the day. And the engineers down there said, okay, we, we get it. And it changed the way that the shuttle was being designed. Uh, so yeah, if, we, if they had tried to fly that thing with jet engines, it would not have been a good idea. It's like, can you imagine having this vehicle about the size of a DC-9 airliner uh, falling down from the sky, trying to pop out these engines, spool up those engines uh, while trying to maintain altitude and stuff, that would have just been a, a, a disaster in waiting. So uh, anyway, yeah, so the X-15, yeah, there's just a little bit of connection between the two. And as I mentioned before, uh, Joe Engel uh, 14 times flew this, uh, the uh, X-15, 
uh, flew the space shuttle twice. Uh, I think it's pretty amazing. He stuck with the program. He was supposed to fly to the moon on Apollo 17 and got bumped uh, for Harrison Smith and lost his chance to walk on the moon, but he still stuck with the program for all those additional years so that he could be the pilot in place to fly on the X-15 or from the X-15 uh, experience on the space shuttle. And uh, it really, really paid off. So uh, wonderful guy and what he did was great. And that direct connection between the X-15 and the shuttle is one that uh, is, is really wonderful. I know in my book, I also talk a lot about what happened uh, with regard to both Challenger and Columbia, uh, because uh, there were a lot of lessons learned in the only fatality of the X-15 program when Mike Adams was lost in November of 1967. And unfortunately, the people at NASA they may have learned the lessons of the unpowered landings through Milt Thompson uh, for the space shuttle, but they did not learn the lessons that were presented by the Mike Adams loss uh, for uh, what happened on the two uh, disasters on the shuttle program. And uh, I was very critical of NASA in my book about both of those things because the lessons were there to be learned. And it was very sad that they didn't do that because both Challenger and Columbia were avoidable. We did not need to lose 14 people. And uh, there are some people at NASA that I will uh, never forgive for the fact that they did not learn from history. That old axiom, we, uh, those who don't learn from history are, are doomed to repeat it. And unfortunately, the operative word there is doomed. Um, uh, it was terrible that we lost people that did not need to be lost. And so they should have carried over more X-15 lessons to the shuttle that they didn't. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. All right, thank you. Jay, you're kind of the, uh, the other softball. Tell me, is there a connection between space stations and the space shuttle? No, nah, no, nah, there's no connection. I mean, heck yeah, no, whatever. Well, anyway, I mean, we know that shuttle was basically intended to help build the space station. It didn't happen until like the last third of its lifetime, but it did happen, but uh, in my book, Outpost on the Frontier, um, which does talk about the history of space stations, when the, when the ISS was being developed, when it was called Space Station Freedom or whatever, they, they of course, uh, wanted to use shuttle to help build it, and without, without shuttle helping to build it, you don't have a program. I mean, yeah, we did have Skylab, but after that lofted, we did not have we did not have another flight ready Saturn V to go. Okay, yes, technically we did, but there's a little thing called Congress and budgets that kind of made that one a little tough. So they put all their eggs in one basket with shuttle, as it were. Uh, but there was another program related to shuttle that not a lot of people talk about, and I mean it's fitting that Columbia actually flew most of these missions, as I understand it, which uh, involved the, uh, the European Space Agency Space Lab. And one of, the, one of the chapters in my book talks heavily about how Space Lab was kind of a, it was a first pass at international uh, cooperation during the design development phase of a space program. And a lot of uh, what what Space Lab turned into was influenced by shuttle and vice versa, because the original plan of Space Lab was send up a short term mission, uh, collect the data, come back, offload the racks, read the data, put, no put another set of experiments on there, loft the shuttle up and uh, collect more data that way, as opposed to when they did Skylab, it was load everything there get it up there and we use what we got on board. Well, it kind of shows that <clears throat> no system is perfect as it were. Um, I mean, space on, on Space Lab, the, the, uh, they did go through some equipment changes. I don't know if you guys remember during, was it STS-41D, I think it was, which was the, uh, the German Space Lab flight. I think it was like mission number five. Uh, 
they launched a uh, set of uh, squirrel monkeys, as I recall, in little cages, and the monkeys were tumbling around so much that it overwhelmed the uh, the fans that were designed to keep the monkey poo and whatever in the cages, and they kind of started drifting through the cabin. And one of the one of the astronauts on board made mention that um, great. I, I joined NASA to fly in space, and here I am with a vacuum cleaning monkey poo out of the space lab. But uh, they they did not fly monkeys on space lab after that. Um, they did fly some rats later on, as I recall. But uh, it was kind of nice where you had that little learning experience right there. If they if they had tried that on Sky Lab, it probably would have been a real real mess. But um, then, of course, the beauty of Space Shuttle is, is the ultimate uh, construction work platform, as it were, because it's got its own independent power source. It's got its own crane. Uh, so you can dock it to a large structure, or you can have it put together smaller structures. And I mean, that's experience that we do not have with any other vehicle. I mean, heck, you see studies these days talking about, oh, yeah, we'll try servicing Hubble with, uh, with an arm maybe docked to, a, uh, to an Orion spacecraft and all that. And I'm thinking to myself, there is no way you're going to be able to do it. The mass of shuttle was really nice. It was appropriate for, for Hubble servicing. Uh, you had a nice little contained payload bay. And... Shuttle was purpose designed for this. Anything else to do that type of thing is going to be a kludge at best. So, but you can read about you can read about how uh, shuttle helped build the space station in my book, Outposts on the Frontier: A 50-Year History of Laboratories and Space Stations in Earth Orbit. I mean, I cover it all. I cover it from MOL, Salyut, Mir, and all that. Uh, all the way up to 2011 and the ISS program and the fine and just past the final launch of shuttle and how the ISS program helped get helped to get shuttle the final launch to loft the alpha mag, alpha magnetic spectrometer, which is hopefully going to help us find more about the origins of the universe. So, all right. Thank you. And, uh, and you say all of that, but I've got a great pitch for a, uh, a stage derived Hubble ser servicing platform that you could, uh, that you could launch on SLS. If, you, if anybody's interested, call me. Um, it's a brilliant idea. But uh, so, so I wrote this question and then I sent it to the panelists ahead of time. And I knew that for, uh, for Michelle, for, uh, for Jay, for, uh, for Melvin, um, it's kind of a softball. Um, some of the others, I'm just really looking forward to their answers. So uh, Mr. Bowman, um, how does uh, how, how does your work relate to uh, to why we're here today? Yes, right. Well, um, you mentioned something about shameless publicity. So, uh, coming soon to all good bookstores, uh, a long voyage to the moon. Um, the uh, story of Apollo seventeen astronaut Ron Evans, and uh, you might think it's a bit of a stretch to link an Apollo astronaut with the shuttle program and. Frankly, it is a bit, but there is a link. Um, after flying to the moon in Apollo 17, uh, Ron did backup duty uh, on the Apollo Soyuz mission. And some astronauts might have thought that was a bit of a come down, a bit of an anti climax, but I'm pretty sure the Apollo Soyuz backup duty was the most exciting and most interesting backup duty that any astronaut ever had to do. Uh, with trips to the Soviet Union, visit to Baikonur, actually getting on board the rail Soyuz capsule that Leonov and Kudasov would fly in. Uh, it was a fascinating experience. But then after the flight in July 1975, Ron found himself in a unique situation. Uh, since his selection as a, a Group 5 astronaut in 1966, uh, he had been involved with specific missions all the way through his astronaut career. Uh, within six months of being selected, he was on the support crew for Apollo 1. And uh, he did support duty for Apollo 7, 
and for Apollo 11, back up on Apollo 14, and then flew to the moon on Apollo 17. Uh, after Apollo Soyuz, the first time really, there was no specific mission for which he was working. And all of the astronauts still in the NASA Corps were uh, allocated to the shuttle, and they all did their bits of work on the shuttle, some work in the office, uh, committee meetings, uh, simulation work, all sorts of stuff. But it just wasn't quite the same as having a specific mission that you were working towards. And uh, for a lot of the astronauts, uh, it, the shuttle really looked like something that was a bit too far off to persevere with. And um, I think the, the important thing is if you look at uh, Ron Evans and Vance Brown, they both came off Apollo Soyuz in July 1975. Uh, Vance had flown the mission, thoroughly enjoyed it. He had had a flight in Earth orbit, but Ron had been to the moon. Now, uh, the two of them were perhaps playing catch up by July 1975. Most of the other astronauts working in the shuttle had been doing it for several years. Um, Vance wanted to fly again. He'd been in Earth orbit. Jack Lauswell wanted to fly again. He had been on Earth orbit. Uh, Paul White's the same. Uh, they hung in there, and we, we, we heard that Michelle mentioned uh, about Joe Engel. Joe didn't get a flight. He hung into the shuttle. But Ron Evans knew that by 1975, it still might be six years before he could fly. Uh, it could be at least 10 years after he had been to the moon. Um, he made the decision that some of the other uh, Apollo astronauts made, no, I'm not going to wait that long. Uh, I've worked on the shuttle, but I, that's it. I'm not going to wait any longer. And the thing is, there seemed to be a bit of a split between those who had been to the moon, men like Charlie Duke, um, Ron Evans himself, um, Stu Rusa, Paul 14. They'd been to the moon, they left, they didn't wait for the shuttle. Whereas others like Jack Lausner and Paul Whites, they did wait and they had other flights. But if you want to understand why some of the astronauts find it easier to leave, I'll give you a quote. Uh, I spoke to Jack Lausner about this. I'll give you a quote from Jack Lausner. And he said, Ron had done what he came to do. He had had a flight to the moon. And it's hard to beat that, you know. Charlie Duke was a little blunter. He said that working in a shuttle was boring, and he didn't wait. Really. Now, flying the shuttle would not have been boring, but it was that six-year wait, six, seven, eight years in many cases, to get a flight that some of the Apollo astronauts, including Ron Evans, was just too long to wait. So uh, Ron left NASA in 1977, and uh, uh, so, he did not go on to fly as a shuttle astronaut. So there's the lack of a link. <laughs> Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Jay, you know, the, uh, the shuttle is, uh, is kind of a hero in my book. Um, how, does, uh, how does shuttle relate to, uh, to your writing? Um, it relates to my writing a lot more than I thought it was going to relate to, to be honest, David. Um, so. My work, for those of you who don't know, really focuses on uncrewed robotic lunar and planetary exploration. The pioneers, the voyagers, Galileo, things like this, the Mars rovers. And when I started writing my first book, it was going to be about just that, uncrewed robotic space missions. And I really thought it was going to be this track that was going to be just completely separate from crewed missions. And I ran into a conflict right away when the Apollo program was approved and all this money just started just diverting. I mean, Apollo could not burn money fast enough. And not only did it take all of this money away from the, uh, the robotic missions, but it changed the purpose of the robotic missions. It changed them from, oh, we're gonna be learning what the moon is made of and studying the moon's magnetic field and all of these things to, 
we're instead going to, to take these things away from the scientific community and we are going to use them to reconnoiter the moon and to determine the right spots to land and what kind of environment we would find out when we land. And I kind of went, oh, you know, that, that, that kind of sucks, but I suppose it all worked out in the end. Um, but then I ran headstrong into crewed space missions again when the shuttle was approved in 1972. And at the same time, same year as, as the shuttle was approved, what happened, there was this massive proposal called the Grand Tour. And four spacecraft were going to fly on two separate Saturn V rockets, and they were going to explore the entirety of the outer solar system, including Pluto. It was going to be a real tour de force. We would have gotten to Pluto decades before New Horizons did. And one of the biggest reasons that it was canceled in, um, in the beginning was because of the shuttle. Well, you know, we're, we're gonna do the shuttle thing and we're, we're not really gonna have uh, any money to do this grand tour. So, so yeah, I don't really care that there's this magnificent planetary alignment that only comes up every 168 years. Um, we're, we're putting all our eggs into a basket with the shuttle. And so you need to find something cheaper or you're not going anywhere. You're not leaving Earth. And, and I came across that quite unexpectedly. And it, it really, um, really played with my emotions, I have to say, from this 10-year-old kid who had gotten up early on a weekend to watch the shuttle take off, now to find out that it was going to be kind of this bad guy so many years later. And unfortunately, it got worse when I started to learn um, that all of the uh, tried and true, dependable, um, expendable boosters like the, the Titan, you know, they, they weren't gonna make those anymore. And the, and the Centaur, it's like, well, they, they weren't gonna make those anymore because everything was going to launch on the shuttle. And it, and it didn't make any sense right when I heard it. There's just no way that this can make economic sense, which by the way, the Soviet Union figured out in 1976 that there was no way that this was going to make sense. Uh, the United States is either lying or they just know something that we don't. Um, but in my current research, uh, there's a, been a, a huge, unfortunately negative impact of the shuttle um, there was this mission Galileo, uh, which was approved in 77, at the same time that people were just starting to work the kinks out of uh, the first shuttle to try and get it prepped for launch. And Galileo was, uh, according to the ambitious NASA launch schedule, Galileo was going to be something like the 28th shuttle mission. And then as time went on, it was going to be the 22nd, and then the 17th, and then the 12th. And then finally, the people in charge of Galileo got a phone call saying, well, we think it's going to be the seventh mission. And, and it just, it kept getting delayed. And it, at one point, the, the shuttle being ready for use was, was so far behind schedule and the projected payload capacity of the shuttle had changed so much that the people running Galileo actually split that spacecraft in two. And instead we were going to launch it on two shuttles because one apparently just wasn't going to be enough. So then there was this effort to integrate the Centaur in with the shuttle. And there's all these philosophical arguments that could be a whole separate panel for all of us, right? On whether Centaur inside a shuttle was going to be a good idea, but still the payload capacities of, of the shuttle were varying so much in this pre-SDS-1 period that uh, one of the key Centaur en engineers, Joe Nieberding, he got thrown out of a meeting at JSC when he accused the shuttle planners of using a random number generator to determine what the shuttle's payload capacity was gonna be. And the JSC people were so upset that they were like, get the hell out of here. And the, the Centaur guys like just had to drop their heads and walk back to their car and go, well, that didn't exactly go very well. Um, ultimately, Galileo did leave Earth uh, many years later than planned. It was, it was supposed to go in 82, and then that got pushed to 84, and then it got pushed to 85, and then it got pushed to 86. It was redesigned four times only because of the shuttle. It had nothing to do with Galileo itself. And then after the Challenger disaster, 
um, the sad joke in the Galileo Project Office was the only way we are going to be able to get this thing to Jupiter uh, is via a, an interactive diorama at the Smithsonian. That's, that's really the, the only thing that, that we're going to be able to do. Um, finally, they did get it off, of course, uh, with STS-34 in October of 89. They were able to send Galileo off, and instead of taking two years to get to Jupiter, it took six. Um, and so I am uh, tracing out this, this long path of uh, Galileo's conflict with, with the shuttle program in, in my next book, which will be coming out probably in a few years. And I'm, I'm a little dismayed by the amount of hate mail I'm probably going to get uh, talking about uh, how bad the shuttle was in terms of its, its negative, just really poor impact on uh, robotic lunar and planetary exploration. Chris? I have a couple of things uh, to say. In my Outward Odyssey book, I was asked to write a book about what happened before humans went into space. So I, and, uh, so I looked it up. There's one mention of the, uh, of the space shuttle in this book. Uh, and this is when I was kind of uh, presaging uh, what Michelle was writing about. You can see the X-15 there and, and one of the pilots, I forget his name, uh, uh, but anyway, uh, so that's not the place to look for the shuttle. Uh, but um, there, there are kind of two observations I, I, I want to make. Uh, my, my most recent book, uh, which is the uh, Hubble book I just wrote, uh, published by NASA. So it's a free electronic uh, download. Uh, because it was uh, paid for by taxpayers dollars. Um, anyway, a lot of that story is, is about the, the, the shuttle and, and, uh, and Hubble is, is just a few days away from celebrating 31 years on orbit. Um, and that wouldn't have been possible without the shuttle. So it's almost, it's almost kind of the opposite story from from what uh, from what Jay says uh, about Galileo, all of which is is a hundred percent valid. Uh, I would I would say, but uh, the uh, the Hubble was one of the signature um, achievements of of the shuttle, along with the ISS. Uh, there's a, a mention for Jay. So uh, there's 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 lots to say. Um, in 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 the shuttle's favor, but I think there is the question of of, of the of the great cost and 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 uh, recently we the NASA had a uh, commercial space uh, conference, and basically uh, there was a couple of comments. Um, to uh, that, that the shuttle was actually an obstacle to the commercialization of space. I think we can uh, uh, talk about that another time. And I just see a note, somebody asked if, if I could put the link up in the comments. I actually did uh, about half an hour ago or earlier in the meeting. So if you look up in the comments, you'll find the link to, to my uh, Hubble book. The third observation I'm going to make is with my Quest uh, editor's hat on. Um, so Quest is, is, is about the history of space exploration. We put out four issues a year. And I get lots of papers uh, and articles about how wonderful Apollo is. Um, and as somebody whose first book was basically about Apollo, I understand that and I plead guilty. Um, I don't get uh, so much about the shuttle, even though we have this, you know, 135 flights, whatever it was, you know, 30 years. Um, it's, uh, it's an interesting observation. And I think one of the great things that the Outward Odyssey series did is that it has published a number of books of, about the shuttle. I'm not sure what the number is uh, out, of, out of the, out of the, the 20 books that have been published so far. Um, but aside from kind of astronaut memoirs, I would argue that there actually aren't that many um, 
books around about the shuttle, when you look at how big a program it was and how many stories there were and, uh, and, and, and all these different aspects to, to the, the shuttle program. So I think actually more people need to, uh, need to get to work and, and, and write about the shuttle. And I'm, I'm trying to do that uh, a little bit of, uh, myself because uh, I've been writing some papers here and there about uh, some interesting aspects of the shuttle program. So I'll leave it there. All right, thank you so much. And I see that Ken has reposted that link to say folks uh, scrolling up. So thank you for taking care of that, Ken. Um, Francis. I'm, I'm looking around this room, if you want to call it that on my screen, and I'm just thinking about all the wonderful books that all of you have written that, um, and the, the quirky different corners of space history that this is the perfect audience to enjoy them. I mean, I, I mean David, you're, with your Skylab book, or as you say in your wonderful Southern preacher kind of way, Skylab, I mean, you sell that program so well. Um, you know, the forgotten space station, the enormous space station, the one that falls through the cracks of history and yet is amazing. You know, Chris with his, his book about the early days of humans, uh, pre-human space flight, pre-satellites. I mean, there's this stuff in there that you don't understand what happened unless you know what came before. I mean, well, I, I believe Mel's going to come up and talk about the payload specialist book he wrote, which is that weird little sliver of shuttle history where it's like anybody can fly, just six months of training, you know, know how to use the bathroom and get out the way of everybody else. And you're in. And that is a amazing human story. And it's a tiny little sliver of history. You know, the shuttle got operational, as they called it. And then after Challenger, that, that stopped. But in those couple of years, there was just this amazing stuff, you know, I mean, Jay Galantine, as you can tell, writes these incredible books about robotic things, which I, I think, well, where's the human story in that? And yet his books are more, there's more heart and humanity in these stories of robots than there are in many of the human stories we tell. We've got the other Jay and his monkey poo. We've got Jeff talking about Apollo 17. Um, and, you know, which is what I get excited about, which is um, when we get to people who went to the moon, like Ron Evans of Apollo 17 that didn't walk, and all those guys got asked, well, you must have been really upset, like being the Mike Collins of the mission. You didn't get to land on the moon and walk around. And most of these people, total opposite. Because if you ask one of us, if you want to go to Earth and you've never been to Earth, then you get three days going round Earth orbit, looking at sunrises and sunsets and all the beauty and majesty of it. Or we're going to put you down in a gravel pit for three days and you can walk half a mile in every direction. Which would we choose? And these, most of these people who were pilots, that's what they wanted. And, and that's, you know, I'm, I'm really looking forward to Jeff's book about um, Apollo 17. And that's kind of where my book, my next book comes in, in this series. Um, Al Warden of Apollo 15, as most of you will know, passed away last year. And a lot of you think that's the last we're going to have heard of him. Two books um, we had just finished. Um, and thank goodness, you know, I had to give him a final polish over the last year. But there, there is more that Al had to say. And if you ever heard Al speak, um, you know that he had very forthright, frank, no holds barred and usually pretty hilarious opinions on everything. Um, so the first that got mentioned already is this a children's book in a different uh, publisher, Astronaut Owl Flies to the Moon, which is um, not only taking you through words and pictures what it's like to go to the moon and back, but he, when he got back from the moon, he basically downloaded his brain in the form of very um, visceral poetry. Um, what was it like? And I got some of those early drafts and was able to work those into a children's book, those emotions and feelings of somebody who's literally just got back, sitting alone in their apartment in the middle of the night, can't sleep going, I need to get this down on paper. But the second book in the, in the University of Nebraska Press uh, series that's coming out in the fall, um, The Light of Earth. And it's basically, we wrote another book before about what he did as an astronaut. And this is what it's like to be an astronaut. And it sounds similar, but it's actually very different. What happens when you're in your 80s and you reflect on being an astronaut and you reflect on things in general? There's a lot in there about the shuttle program. He was involved in early meetings and design changes and he kind of saw what might work, what might, what might not work. He's talking about private space flight. Um, he's talking about the thing I love the best is all of the 24 people who travel to the moon he does a little biography and a pretty forthright opinion on them, whether he liked them or whether he didn't like them, you're gonna find out. There are things like that in this book that um, he says that, I know so many people were like, I wish we could hear from him again, and you can. And so I'm, I'm 
very honored that we got that out. But um, I also, as you can tell, I encourage you, everybody watching this to check out all these books because there are all these quirky little corners of Spacefly that everybody here has written about. It's, it's a fascinating series. Thanks so much. I, uh, I mentioned that Colin had shared his, his upcoming book with me. Francis has shared three pages of, uh, of that book with me and I'm sold. It's, it's just based on those, uh, those three pages. It's a, uh, it's a must buy. Um, Mel, how about you? Yeah, this is going to be a big letdown for Jay. I'd like to tell everybody here that I have the right stuff and I would have made a terrific astronaut. I can't because I'd be lying. I would have been a terrible astronaut. But as a scientist, had my career gone in a little bit different direction, just maybe I could have flown as a payload specialist because you didn't need to go through all that training. Uh, our book, Come Fly With Us, along with John Jaskowskis, uh, tells the story of what I like to say, ordinary people flying into space. I quote ordinary because if you've read the book, you know these people were anything but ordinary, all the way from uh, Charlie Walker creating his ride into space to the Europeans' passion to go. If you haven't read it, there's a great story there. And I think I'm confident, John agrees with me, that we've proven the program works. And now with commercial crew coming on, SpaceX, uh, Virgin Galactic, I think you're gonna see the equivalent of the payload specialist come back. Just, just keep watching. Uh, looking forward, Everybody loves to see the face of a spacewalking astronaut with a big grin looking out through their faceplate. And yeah, that's fun, but they're up there doing really hard work. It's not easy work. And most people don't realize what it took for them to get there. The training, it's not easy. And sometimes actually the training is probably more dangerous than actually going into doing a spacewalk. Um, but there is danger in it. Uh, it's difficult for some, it's easy for others. Uh, there's a lot of euphoria. We have a lot of good comments from astronauts on what it's like to actually be out there. So uh, hopefully that book will be coming out sometime soon, Colin, after we get it written. We're about halfway there, but uh, stay tuned. Thank you so much. Colin? Okay, uh, when the Outward Odyssey series began, the shuttle program was uh, in its second decade. And that was meant to be pretty much the end of the series, which at the embryonic stage was going to be eight books. Uh, Francis and I had written two. I contacted Chris to fill in a gap between, say, the X-Planes and Yuri Gagarin. And then Chris and Emmeline were going to finish off the series with a book realising tomorrow. It's amazing how it's evolved. And I look around these this eclectic group of people, and only half of the authors are actually represented here. But boy, what an intriguing group of people you are. The series, yes, it was meant to be a progressive series. And in its latter days, it, it started branching out. We started getting into biographies. We started getting into books about the payload specialists. And it, it, it's, it's still ongoing. As I said, people are still approaching me saying, hey, I've got this great idea. Rich Jurek, who put out a marvellous biography of George Lowe, is now working on his second book, another biography, uh, on Julius Shear, the uh, NASA publicity man, public affairs, uh, an intriguing story that's never been told. And this is what the series is about, that people can come to the series, they can learn about the X-Planes, they can learn about the Apollo program, Gemini, Mercury. They can learn about the space shuttle. They can learn about EVA. They can learn about all manner of things to do with the history of human spaceflight. And that is the mandate of this series, is to tell that and to tell it as a human story. And I believe that through these authors, we've achieved that. And it's a series that people should always look to. Uh, from my own point of view, as I said, I uh, grew up in the early days of space flight. I was uh, in space flight. So the thing that really had an impact on me in my mid-teens was when Ted Freeman died. And that really impacted on me heavily. Uh, I didn't know what to do. We have lost an astronaut. I remember writing a letter to Charlie Bassett. I knew he was a great friend of Ted Freeman's. 
and express my condolences. And uh, Charlie wrote back a, a beautiful letter. Within a week of receiving that letter, Charlie and Elliot C had both been killed in the T-38 uh, crash into their uh, McDonald plant in Missouri. So I also recall going out one Sunday morning in Australia to buy a hamburger and I saw this newspaper headline, three astronauts die in pad fire. So all of these things, apart from the accomplishments, the majesty, the wonderful things that the astronauts are doing, there were these deaths in this program. And that's how the book Fallen Astronauts came about, which is the story of the people who reached out for the moon, but never quite made it. And later on, many years later, I knew there were many other undiscovered stories to be told. And in fact, one of them uh, in this book, again, a shameless promotion, Shattered Dreams, is Phil Chapman. We lost Phil two days ago. His story is told in this book. If you want to know something about this astronaut, who never flew, but was an Apollo astronaut, the first Australian astronaut. It's in this book. And that's what we set out to achieve. And quite frankly, I believe we've achieved it. Thanks to you wonderful people. Thank you so much, Colin. So we're, uh, we're, we're running a little longer than I anticipated, um, but I want to get this last question in. Um, Jay, I'm going to ask you if you would, I'm going to hold your presentation, I'm going to finish this question, and then I'll let you do a, a little presentation at the end to kind of book in what, uh, what Michelle opened us up with. But, um, and so on, for the, uh, for, the, for the panelists, I'm giving you an incredible charge. Um, my question was, my, my final question was going to be kind of writ large, the, uh, what is the, uh, the legacy of the shuttle? Um, in the meantime, we've gotten several questions in the Q&A that kind of touch on that. Um, at what point in time did you realize that the, uh, the shuttle wouldn't achieve the promise of cheaper and safer access to space? Um, that was a question. Um, what were your thoughts on the, uh, the efficacy of the vehicle? Um, didn't live up to expectations, but did amazing things. Um, for, the, uh, for the half of the panel that was, uh, that was watching this um, or portions of this internationally, uh, what is the international, what is, what is your your perception of the US shuttle program from an international perspective. Um, I'm not expecting everybody to, uh, to deal with every one of those issues. I'm just kind of framing the, uh, the, the, the question that we're, uh, that, that's before us, but also we're running late, so don't take too long. Uh, so, so, uh, so, that's Brent Broad says, Jay, you're darn right it is. Um, but like I said, I mean, shuttle at this point is half of human space flight history, half of human space flight history is shuttle history of the other half. Um, a quarter of that is either waiting for shuttle or waiting for something after shuttle. And uh, only, only uh, you know, the other quarter is, uh, is things other than, from a US perspective, things other than shuttle flying. Um, shuttle flew twice as long as, uh, as everything else in the US put together. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's quite a legacy. So uh, Michelle, start us off. Uh, what's it, which one of those questions would you like me to answer? <laughs> say what, say things about shuttle, Michelle. <laughs> Looking back, what's the legacy? Uh, well, yeah, I think the legacy, as you said, this, it takes up so much of human spaceflight, uh, history now, uh, it's identified as the spaceflight program. It's going to take a long time, uh, in, into the future before that really changes. Uh, the shuttle has entered our consciousness and it was there for so long that as we know people right here, such as yourself, that's, you know, the shuttle was the be all and end all of the space program for your own personal memories. So, um, I mean, for myself, I have so many personal memories of the space shuttle because I was involved with the program, uh, covering it, writing about it, uh, being on board it. I was actually on board Atlantis as well. Um, I worked for a company that we had, uh, we had equipment that was mounted to the space shuttle. We were part of a program to 
find out whether or not the shuttle tail was experiencing flutter during re-entry, which would have been absolutely catastrophic. And so it was a really profound memory for me is being down at the Cape, uh, working on that specific program, installing equipment on the orbiter Atlantis that was going to be carried into space, that was going to bring us data about what it was accomplishing and how it was reacting. Very proud of the fact that our equipment it was able to tell that this flutter that they were worried about so desperately, uh, I mean, could you imagine an orbiter losing a tail on its re-entry? Uh, yeah, there's no way it would have been survivable, but our equipment proved that it wasn't happening. And so to be associated with that is, is a profound memory for me uh, being uh, you know, crawling around inside the engine compartment of Atlantis, uh, uh, installing this stuff. And um, at one point, um, walking up the catwalk, it's like a four-story catwalk that takes you up to the very top of the tail of the orbiter and doing something I was not supposed to do, but I could not resist doing it, is the fact that on the, on the back upper edge of the orbiter, I stood there with nobody else around and I put my thumbprint on the back of Atlantis's tail. And the next launch, my thumbprint flew into space and that was pretty cool. So hopefully nobody at NASA is gonna come run after me after all these years, because luckily that didn't do anything. I figured the thumbprint's out of the airstream so it should be safe, but uh, just all those kind of, of memories were just absolutely amazing to me. Um, being there for the launch of STS-7, the first American woman in space, meeting Sally Ride, all those kind of things. Uh, STS-34, I was there for the launch of Galileo, uh, Jay was talking about, and the protests from the nuclear uh, uh, demonstrators and stuff was something else. Um, and, and being there for STS-58 that I talked about really briefly in my presentation because a, a close friend of mine was in the cockpit and had just come back from space. Uh, Rick was just such a wonderful guy and uh, left us all way, way, way too soon. So, those are the, so the legacy of the shuttle is very personal to me uh, for all these things. I mean, I was a little kid during Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo. So those, those memories are something special, but the shuttle was hands-on for me. So yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll let you go from there, so. Thank you for sharing and, uh, and thank you for your contributions. We're, we're you know, kind of all here as, as authors talking author things, but, uh, but for your part, um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jay. All right, well, Concerning shuttle's legacy and concerning the e efficacy, I would say this. Yes, shuttle did not necessarily meet the oversold promises of the 1970s, but what we got, we probably learned so much more. I mean, you've, I mean the shuttle program is kind of like life. You have your goals, you have your plans, but things never quite go exactly the way you want them to. Um, I mean, the only real thing I can fault NASA for on the shuttle is that we tried to design the equivalent of a 707 with DC-3 technology. And well, we kind of saw what the limitations are with that. I mean, we made bold promises. I mean, the boldest of the promises or the boldest of the goals was, I mean, when you think about it, two guys strapping themselves into a unproven flight vehicle that had not been flown in orbit unmanned and doing the flight and coming back safely. I mean, yeah, we we're all on cloud nine. We thought NASA can do no wrong. Well, unfortunately, Challenger showed us the limitations of our thinking, but Concerning the efficacy, it just goes to show that 
any endeavor worth doing is going to have some level of difficulty. People are going to be lost. We can't let our fear of that necessarily paralyze us, but at the same time, too, we cannot necessarily be cavalier about it either. I mean, when I look at things that are going on down in Boca Chica, Texas, with the plans for the SpaceX Starships, I mean, I'm listening to a lot of the promises, and I'm thinking back to the promises of the shuttle program. And I mean, heck, there's a big fan club over it. But at the same time, too, I mean, yeah, private industry says, oh, yeah, we can do it better than NASA and do this. Well, it's like, okay, yeah, you guys are going to have to prove it. But don't just look at what things were done wrong as a way to say, oh, yeah, we're going to do it better than them. Learn from what happened that did go wrong, but also learn about what happened that did go right. Don't just totally dismiss that knowledge out of, out outright. Otherwise, the first time a manned vehicle from private industry goes up and somebody gets killed on it, a lot of people that are a lot more gun shy than those of us that have followed the space program for years are going to look at it and say, why didn't you think of this before you actually did it? So I will leave it at that. Thank you so much. Mr. Bowman. Well, the legacy of the space shuttle, uh, in one sense, I watch that legacy quite often passing as a brightly moving bright star over my back garden. And that reminds me of the legacy of the shuttle as the International Space Station flies on. And um, the, the shuttle, I think, uh, the legacy of, is one of ongoing living and working in space and preparing for the future in space, including long voyages to Mars and further voyages to the moon. Uh, multiple astronauts who trained and provided a huge body of knowledge about flying in orbit. And that will all go on to assist with those future voyages. So the shuttle's legacy, I think, is, is one that tells us that nothing is impossible with ingenuity, with skill, with bravery, and also with funding, adequate funding. And we saw what happened with the Space Shuttle. It was overpromised and underfunded. And we know what the indirect effects of that were. Um, Ron Evans of Apollo 17 got into some hot water in 1972 by criticizing the Nixon administration uh, for talking about space, but not doing enough about it, uh, paying lip service to space, but not actually funding the space program adequately. Uh, but he was absolutely right. And we saw what happened when the shuttle was underfunded. So the, the leg perhaps the best legacy for the shuttle would be that all governments around the world, which are planning and preparing these momentous missions to, the Mar to Mars and to the moon, that they realize that it's not just about building the spacecraft. You always find men and women uh, who will fly those missions and you always find dedicated engineers who will build the equipment, but you have to adequately fund the missions if you want to actually go further out into space. You must fund it properly. And that is one legacy of the shuttle, one lesson to be learned that perhaps all of those governments need to bear in mind. If you're going to do it, if you're actually going to make these bold steps into the future, it will cost money and you've got to pay the money. Thank you so much. I, uh, I saw somebody on comment, comment on Twitter um, yesterday. The, uh, you know, the president of the White House just announced their, uh, their budget priorities for, uh, for the, uh, the coming FY22 fiscal year. Um, if appropriated, the, uh, the, the Biden request on, on 
Cur uh, you know, based on the actual figure would be the, uh, the largest budget NASA has ever received. Um, adjusting for inflation, it would put NASA back where they were in 1993. So uh, <laughs> I, uh, I agree with you completely. Funding is, a, uh, is an important thing. Um, Jay. Yes. Um, I've done a lot of reading about the shuttle. And to me, the, the real legacy of this program is I really think it was the, the ultimate test program. Because if, if you look at the history of it, the, the, it first flew in 81, and the decision was made to make one in 72. And, and the decision to even build one, to build this reusable space transportation system, it goes back several years. I mean, at, at least to 1964, even while they're st still trying to get Gemini spun up in NASA, right? They were still arguing about what to do after Apollo. And there are so many technologies that were tested, improved, maybe perfected on the shuttle. Some of those go back to the 1950s. And there was so much theoretical work, uh, so much lab work, so much wind tunnel work. And I really think those people didn't know what the right answer was until you put them all together in a shuttle and kind of found out found out whether we can have a reusable space transportation system that truly can land like an airplane and you just have to empty out the ashtrays and fluff the pillows and, and it's ready to go again. Um, but there were all these technologies. If, if you read about this, this thing, it was like, I mean, even something like the insulation on the external tank were these you know, two different polymers and it was rubbery at room temperature, but once the chilled liquids went in, it changed to a consistency of glass and they vibrate it and they, they shake it and they put all these strain gauges on, but they don't really know if this is gonna be the right thing until they fly it. And it was the same thing with, oh, well, we can just reuse the solid boosters from the Titan and well, you can't because of the way the thrust vectoring works and oh, well, we need to come up with a thrust vectoring solution that is reusable. Well, how are we going to do that? Well, what if we layered these, these Teflon baffles together with this stuff that didn't really ablate away? And how do we really know if that works? How do we really know how it's going to go to, to have a man-rated solid booster until we actually go out and do that? And, and, and the same thing with uh, you know, the tiles and this whole concept of a reusable hot surface. And can we really build a shuttle out of aluminum and have this reusable uh, thermal protection system? How do we know if that works until really until we go in and try it? So at the end of the day, that's what I come down to is that there were all these technologies. I mean, some of those insulation tests, they were going back to the late 50s on that stuff. And, and they weren't really going to find out what the right path was until they used it. And I think that's what the shuttle was, at least for me. Thank you so much. Chris. A couple of things. There's all sorts of lessons learned and I'm not gonna go into them except to observe that most, a lot of them showed that uh, going into space is a lot more difficult and a lot more expensive than uh, a lot of people thought, which is why uh, some of the hopes for the shuttle weren't realized. The other thing is access. The majority of people who've been into space flew on the shuttle, even today, 10 years after the, the shuttle uh, last flu. And uh, when this question came up, uh, I looked for a line, uh, a couple of sentences I wrote in my uh, Hubble book uh, about the shuttle program. It said, during its 135 flights, 355 individuals from 16 countries through flew 852 times aboard the shuttle. The five shuttles traveled more than 542 million miles or 872 million kilometers and hosted more than 2,000 experiments in the fields of earth, astronomical, biological, and material sciences. Shuttles deployed 180 payloads, including satellites, returned 52 from space, 
and retrieved, repaired, and redeployed seven spacecraft. So uh, that's uh, um, that's quite a record there. So I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much, Francis. The, the sheer ambition of the shuttle, you're, if you go to the Smithsonian's Udvar-Hazy Center just outside of DC and you look at this enormous boilerplate um, Apollo spacecraft they have, you look how big that thing is, then you turn your eyes and you look at a real space shuttle and you just go, these people went from a couple of years from going from that to that. It's mind blowing the ambition of that thing. Um, and that really tells you a lot, but it is, the un it is going to be, I think, sadly, in many ways, the unloved um, space program. It is going to be like the Star Trek Deep Space Nine TV series while every, all the other Star Trek ones are flying off exploring and zipping around. This is the one that kind of just stayed in low Earth orbit and did lots of stuff. But that, and that's not fair. Um, but you, asked, you asked us to be brief, so I really just want to talk about two things real quickly. Um, one is what we don't do before the shuttle and after the shuttle. It's very easy to criticize many things the shuttle couldn't do. But look at what we've lost. Look at what we can't do now. Look at how they were designing jetpacks to fly out of the payload bay of that thing. And they decided we don't need it because this enormous space shuttle is so maneuverable, we can actually just cant it over to the thing and get the arm out and do things in, in person. The maneuverability of that thing, the size of the payload, the fact that they could have brought the entire Hubble Space Telescope back if they wanted, or big space station models, messed around with them, taken back up again. There's things that we couldn't do before and now we can't do again. We will, I hope, soon enough. David, that's your job, but uh, we, we, we can't now. So what we've lost is what we've lost. But the most important thing to me, what Chris was talking about is people. We've had people from almost every country in the world, dozens of them. We've had people of every ethnicity. We've had different genders. Just the other day, I'm talking to a young Latina here in San Diego, talking about the excitement of spacecraft. And I talk about the fact that the first Latina in space, Ellen Ochoa, is from the same neighborhood in here in San Diego as she is. And, and it was like turning a light bulb on. Her face just went like, you mean there's people who look like me who did this? And I'm like, yes, dozens of them. And they flew the shuttle and this is what it did. So when it comes to people, I think the legacy is, is there because it's inspiration. It's um, the next generation of people who realize people who look like pe people from my country, people from my background flew the shuttle. And that is once you turn that faucet on, it does not get turned off. But that's me being brief. <laughs> Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Mel? Yeah, for me, there are several factors uh, to define the legacy of this baby. Uh, one, longevity. It was a workhorse, 30 years. Think about it. Nothing has come close. 30 years. That's crazy. Secondly, the breadth of the missions. Think about it. Everything from cutting edge science, uh, you mentioned material science, astronomy, life sciences, it goes on and on. And I can assure you, that each one of us are benefiting from those investigations right here on Earth today. Um, then they deployed satellites. Not only that, they plucked broken ones out of orbit, fixed them, and sent them back on their mission. Then they constructed the entire International Space Station. If that's not an impressive breadth of missions, I don't know what is. So longevity and breadth of missions, that's the legacy. Thank you so much. Colin? Well, Going last is extraordinarily difficult because everybody has said everything that I agree with. That's the cop out, isn't it? But the legacy of the, the true legacy of the shuttle is 30 years of extraordinary achievement. People have not yet mentioned things like the Hubble Space Telescope. Astronomers just went wild when they saw those first images after the repair, the first repair mission. That is an ongoing benefit of mankind. Meteorology has taken great advances. Other earth sciences and observations, we, we have more reliable weather forecasts. People don't realize the legacy, the true legacy of the space shuttle. But in brief, there's one thing I would like to do, and that's just to say, a very sincere thank you to the men and women who have always been involved in the space shuttle program, particularly the men and women, as Francis said, of all ethnicities who have piloted or worked on the space shuttle. Incredibly brave people, knowing that they were sitting on top of basically a controlled explosion, and but they did not let this phase them. 
they set out to do what they wanted to do for the benefit of everyone. And that I think is the legacy of the space shuttle, that these people did these extraordinary things. We did lose some along the way, which was incredibly sad, but for 30 years, we had magnificence. And I think that is the true legacy of the space shuttle. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I mean, and, and like you say, members of the panel have hit on, you know, the, the, if I'm gonna have the bullet points, you know, established a, a lasting human foothold in, in space, um, opening our eyes to the, uh, to the universe, um, bringing the world closer together, um, you know, the science that was conducted because of and on the, uh, the space shuttle. Um, gosh, I don't know, did anybody touch on the, uh, the role that the shuttle played in, in keeping the Cold War cold and, and ultimately, you know, helping to, uh, to end the Cold War? Um, my, one of my favorite spinoff stories is that, uh, that the shuttle helped fight, uh, helped fight cancer accidentally, um, that, a, uh, that a technology that was developed because Hubble didn't work when it was deployed um, improved the, uh, the quality of mammograms and helped identify uh, you know, breast cancer cases earlier. Um, you know, I could go on and on and on about all the, uh, the good that's come from the shuttle, but everybody has their program. You know, the, the program that you've lived, we've kind of talked about today, shuttle is, is my program. And now 10 years out, there's a, uh, there's a new generation that, uh, that shuttle is not their program. You know, they're seeing, uh, they're seeing Dragon and they're seeing these new vehicles come online. And, uh, and so shuttle is kind of on trial now with a, uh, with a new generation that's having some of these same arguments that we had of, um, well, here's what it didn't do. You know, it, it, it never lowered costs the way that it was supposed to. It never hit the flight rate that it was supposed to. It, it didn't do this, it didn't do that. And all fair criticisms to be sure. Um, Francis talked about the ambition. Shuttle could only happen at the exact moment that it did. You look at this vehicle, this vehicle is insane. We need a vehicle that's gonna be a, uh, an RV, but it also needs to be a uh, U-Haul, but it also needs to be a science laboratory, but it also needs to be a uh, glider, but it also needs to be a rocket, but it also needs to be, and, and the only moment that that happens, right? Shuttle goes from being a, a pre-program to a program. Uh, shuttle gets the other uh, congressional approval to move ahead as John Young is walking on the moon, right? And that's the only moment that happens because any other moment, you know, could we, should we do this? Should we build a space program that do, uh, does all of these things or is that insane? Um, but when you realize you're talking to a human being standing on the moon, um, like maybe it's not that insane. Like maybe it is possible. Um, and the answer is, it was a little ambitious. You know, I mean, it never did live up to those uh, to those early expectations. You can judge it for the expectations it didn't live up to, or you can judge it for for the things that it did. And and the comment has been made, and it's completely true. We never saw its like before. We haven't seen its like since. And uh, despite you know, despite Francis's kind words about things in work now, the reality is there's nothing in work now that is its like. I don't know that we will ever in my lifetime see the like of space shuttle again. A vehicle with that diverse range of capabilities. We'll see vehicles that are better at this or better at that or cheaper at this or more powerful at that. But we, I don't know that we will ever see a vehicle that is everything as broad, as capable, as diverse as, uh, as shuttle was. And so, you know, what is the legacy of shuttle? You either judge it by the things that it could have been that it wasn't, or you judge it by the things that it was that nothing else could be. And if, and if shuttle was a failure because of the things that it didn't live up to, then the legacy of shuttle is check your ambition then the legacy of shuttle is don't reach farther than you know you can reach. Then the legacy of shuttle is don't try anything that you don't know you can be successful at. And I'm not comfortable with that being the legacy of shuttle. I, I, I would hope that the, uh, that the legacy of shuttle is that, you know, if you do things that you never dreamed you could do, then uh, that's, that's, that's a goal worth shooting for. So um, I, uh, I think that, uh, that that kind of wraps up the uh, the Q and A part of the panel. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Jay for his presentation. But before I do, I want to uh, I want to thank again uh, Michelle. Thank you very much, Jeffrey. Thanks for uh, for joining us today. Um, both Jays. It's a uh, it's always a pleasure when we can have a, a two J panel uh, come together. Uh, Chris, <laughs> Francis. Uh, 
Well then, Colin, thanks for uh, thanks for waking up. <laughs> Ridiculous! You're a more dedicated man than I am. I uh, I, I I appreciate this. So, uh, and uh, and particularly thanks again to uh, to Ken to the AIAA uh, Los Angeles Las Vegas section um, to everybody that has dialed in today. We uh, it's been a great pleasure looking through the uh, the guest list and seeing the uh, you know the, uh, the the notables that joined us today. We really appreciate your time. And uh, with that, thank you very much. And I'm going to turn it over to, uh, to Jay Kladdick. Okay. Don't worry, people. This is relatively brief. Uh, but, I mean, it's not just about shuttle being a legacy for aerospace project. There's also a pop culture legacy, as it were, too. Let me go ahead and uh, share my screen. Slideshow. Here we go. Columbia's pop culture influences, or as I like to say, and that's the way it was. Well, of course, April 12th, 1981, when we see this big bird on its white fuel tank go flying, we all remember it well, but not too many of us, well, those who were not born at the time don't realize that there was a time when we didn't have this image in front of us. Uh... Time Magazine kind of recognized it. I mean, heck, this was their cover story during that week. And a lot of people that grew up in that period have still have this issue in their collections. I don't, but uh, I heard about this and it would have been nice to have one of these, but my family didn't, didn't collect time at the time. That's weird. Why did I say that? Well, anyway, the big hit on the block in the 1970s, of course, was Space Shuttle Enterprise. And there was already a, a bit of a merchandising onslaught, as it were. The, uh, the lunchbox, I do have one of these. No, I did not have one at the time because there was no store that had this at the time when I was buying lunchboxes. Uh, Ravel, of course, uh, they had... Uh, a lot of model coverage on Enterprise with this really cool pop box art showing Enterprise on the back of the 747. And we're thinking, oh, this is going to be what it is. Uh, so we're going to see this beauty with its nice white and black paint job eventually la launching on that external tank and solid rocket boosters. Well, this was, I believe, probably my very first shuttle toy. No, this is not the one I had when I was a kid, but... Uh, Process Plastics was a company that made uh, kind of acetate plastic toys. They had a, they did have like a, a Saturn V moon rocket that I remember from when I was a kid, done up in red, white, and blue plastic with these big USA stickers and stuff. And I did have one of these, even though I was probably a little bit old for it. These things were built like a tank. And then a few years later, they did put a uh, set of solid rocket boosters and an external tank with it, but initially all we had was the orbiter. Okay, Francis French probably remembers this one. Um, 1979, uh, to capitalize on Star Wars, uh, the, the producers of the James Bond film series tried to make a movie featuring shuttle that corresponded with the time period when shuttle would actually fly. Well, Moonraker be beat the real shuttle into orbit by about two years. And model companies that had space shuttle models already in, in the works decided to do them in these markings. Well, this is what we thought. Yeah, launch a fleet of shuttles. You could send people up to this big, massive space station. Didn't quite happen like that, but that just shows how the pop culture of shuttle was influencing us at the time. Well, when we finally saw Columbia, it looked like this, this thing that, uh, well, it got rolled out of Palmdale. And uh, a lot of people say, oh, all the tiles fell off when it flew to Florida. No, that's not what happened. The plan was to, since, since uh, Rockwell had to build up a workforce in Florida, they were going to finish the work there and then keep the best people around to act as technicians on the shuttle program. Well, obviously it took longer than they intended when they uh, got the shuttle and there were problems with Columbia, but what we had was something that looked similar to Enterprise, but quite a bit different. And we were getting a glimpse of things to come. Ravel kind of understood that. In fact, when this, uh, this big Space Shuttle Columbia and 172 scale kit was announced, all the literature 
said it was going to be Space Shuttle Enterprise. Well, Columbia was going to be the flight orbiter. Uh, Enterprise was not going to fly in space because somebody decided, hey, if we take the static test, or, test article number 99, which we were supposed to test to destruction and maybe don't do that, we can build it as a flight orbiter and not have to spend as much money as it would take to take Enterprise apart and rebuild it as a flight orbiter. STA-99 became what we know as Challenger. So this was the first time we saw that Columbia was going to be the orbiter front and center for what came next. And internationally, shuttle was getting popular. Again, you see Enterprise on Airfix's kit. Monogram was saying, okay, we don't know what shuttle is going to fly, so we're not going to mention the name shuttle or Columbia or Challenger on there, even though it's on the decal sheet. But as you can see, the appearance looks a bit closer to like what we saw with Columbia when it rolled out of Palmdale. Well, this is kind of your transition point here. I've actually got both of these National Geographic issues. The, uh, the first one with Enterprise on the cover actually came out in um, March of 81 was the date on it, even though I believe the issue came out like in January. Uh, the, there were pictures of Columbia in there, but not the Columbia that we eventually saw fly. Um, but later that year, we got this nice retrospective on Columbia's flight. Beautiful imagery of the launch. Uh, Bob Crippen commented on how his heart rate was pretty high and John Young's was pretty low. And John made the comment, yeah, after all these launches, I couldn't get my heart to beat any faster. We even got an article in there, a little blurb written by a certain author by the name of Tom Wolf, who would come out with a book called The Right Stuff. Uh, model rocketry was influenced. The, uh, the SD shuttle was my first model of Columbia. I built that thing. I flew it over 30 times before it finally died. Um, Centauri also had their rocket. And it's quite funny how both companies had different rockets, even though they were owned by the same owners at the time. Um, I'd like to get another one of these if I can, because that was my favorite rocket growing up, and it was my very first. And I built it wrong, just like the real thing, but I still got a lot of flights out of it. Okay, this is probably one of the, the most unusual models to come out of the space program, the Gillows kit. Now, Gillows makes stick and tissue models that you build up with spruce and balsa, full frame, and then you put on a, a skinning material. This was not designed to fly. This was display only. But it's interesting. Gillows said that this was their best-selling model until January of 1986. After that, it took them 10 years to sell the remaining stock of shuttle models. That's how popular shuttle was in, the, in those years before Challenger gave us a reality check, unfortunately. Now this one ought to elicit a few chuckles. This is probably the most unusual Columbia piece that I have ever seen. The Columbia Solid State AM radio, which you could get if you went into Radio Shack that year. <laughs> This was a strange one. I mean, they had done they had done a shuttle radio first, but you got it right here, front and center. This is not just a space shuttle radio. This is Columbia, baby. Here we go. This one's probably even more silly. Uh, but yes, 1980s, of course, we had GoBots, we had Transformers, and uh, this is a, a toy model of Columbia as the Transformers as the converting robot Spacey. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, they, I mean, Transformers had Astro Train. Uh, that's what it was back then. That's how popular shuttle was. There were at least four transforming toy models that I know of. Correction, five, if you count Skylinks, of shuttle at the time. And of course, the model companies, they capitalized on the first launch of uh, Columbia. This is the boxing of MPC space shuttle model kit that came out, I think about three months after the shuttle flew. And it's like, here it is, Columbia, front and center, 
white external tank, solid rocket boosters. That this was this was the big thing. This is the kit that the kids had to have. And a few years later, well, uh, STS one still resonates. Uh, this was done in the 1990s. Bob Crippen, I believe, was the very one of the very first, if not the very first astronaut to get immortalized as a GI Joe. And the GI Joe was a Bob Crippen. It was not GI Joe dressed as a shuttle astronaut. I believe that uh, Bob Crippen actually even beat John Glenn to having a figure of him made. Because even though there was a Mercury astronaut made at the same time that the Bob Crippen figure was, the Mercury astronaut was just a GI Joe. There was one that looked kind of like John Young or John Glenn and another one that kind of looked like uh, Scott Carpenter but there was only one Bob Crippen figure ever done and this was it and of course over 30 years the shuttle did change appearance quite a bit I mean the white tank went away after two flights we had the brown tank and well Columbia's markings are unique these these black chimes here only Columbia ever had that those were not black tiles on top of the wings. Those were actually black painted white tiles because somebody thought the thermal loads might cause the wing to warp when you're in orbit. Well, it didn't happen that way, so they didn't do it on any others. And the flag on this wing, the big USA on this wing, Columbia was unique. Challenger's markings didn't quite look like that. And when you get to the modern shuttle program, you got the meatball, you got the flag in Atlantis on the other side. But... You see images of a shuttle, even if it doesn't, you can't read the name, you know it's Columbia if it's got those wings. And I'll leave you with this. This is kind of my own little immortalization of Columbia. Yes, this is from STS-107, but I mean, Bob Crippen kind of said it best uh, during the uh, memorial that they had for the program. He said that Columbia was a bit heavier in the rear a lot of us can empathize with that. She went before her time that she did. She taught us a lot. She'll continue to teach us a lot. Even in the case of her final flight, she was still delivering the data and we still have her influences this day for both from an aerospace standpoint and also from a pop culture standpoint. So, hail Columbia. You gave us you gave us a good run, and thank you for that. That's all I have. All right, thank you so much. Um, I think we uh, we stand adjourned. This was wonderful, everybody. Yes, it was. Always a pleasure. If you look at the chat, we've got people who flew the shuttle listening to us talk about the shuttle, which is always mind blowing to me. It's like, why aren't they? Why are we not in the audience? And why are they not up here? But that's what, say, what an I, honor! I, what an honor! I saw his name pop up, and you know, there's the temptation to uh, why don't we just switch switch the audience and the uh, and the panel? <laughs> That'll work. Yeah. So, so who who popped up? I didn't even see that. Well, we had Claude Nicolier, the first and so far only Swiss. Um, astronaut popped in. Uh, oh yeah, the uh, the good old arm specialist on the on the first Hubble flight. That was that was cool. Yeah, Claude, we we still admire your work all these years later, as we should. Yeah, this has been an amazing uh, afternoon. Well, morning for some of us, probably evening for others. So, uh, as as to have all these wonderful people or from all over the world uh, to be part of this, uh, the Outward Odyssey series. As I mentioned in the chat way, way long time ago, it's all Colin's fault that we are here today. Uh, I cannot thank Colin enough for starting what is going to be, I think, a series that will continue for probably decades to come. Even long after you and all others are gone, I think the Outward Odyssey series needs to continue. You started something that's going to continue to uh, document space flight for the foreseeable future. 
Yeah, yeah Colin, yeah. you're editor for life. <laughs> Whether you want to be or not. <laughs> Whether you want to be or not. Yeah, exactly. I don't know. I, I think our book series is going to end up becoming the shuttle program of space book series because <laughs> we'll, we'll have probably more authors participating in our series than any other book series on, on the space program. <laughs> Absolutely. Does that mean we're also the Deep Space Nine of uh, a space book series? <laughs> I'm okay with that. That's, that's... <laughs> Yeah. I hope not. I, saw I was there. disappointed you didn't get a chance to ask about favorite shuttle missions because I had this already. STS-117. Uh, and uh, that was my favorite mission because it was the only one I saw from Kennedy Space Center being okay, launched. Excellent. My picture. So, All right. Well, May as well. I'm hoping we can to chime in on that same subject with STS-95 because I nearly lost my job because of John Glenn. Uh, I received an invitation to attend his launch from Scott Parazinski, and uh, the only way I could do it was on a working flight to Los Angeles and back with a Qantas crew. I was in charge of the crew, but when we got to Los Angeles, I sprinted across to the airport, flew to Orlando, watched the flight, managed to get a lift back to Orlando Airport, flew back to Los Angeles and got back in time to take my crew back to Sydney. If I hadn't made it back, I probably would have been looking for another job. So that's, that is my favorite flight. And in fact, it is my one and only launch that I ever witnessed live. It's, it's kind of funny because STS-121 did get me fired from my job and that's why I decided to take a space authoring thing. So, isn't that irony for you? <laughs> I've never seen a launch. Well, I don't know, Jay. We just got to get you down there when uh, when when uh, SLS flies. I was going to say Artemis One will be a uh, a show like none before it. So, come down and join. I'm going to watch something launch that doesn't have people on it. So, what's the point? Because it'll be the first time we've launched anything that big in over 10 years. So here's the thing. When you're sitting in Florida, you can't see the people. Um, you can feel the rumble. You can see the height. You can see the fire. You can feel it in your heart. Um, you can't see the people. So uh, it, it'll be okay. It'll be worth watching. With SLS, Jay could probably stay home and feel the launch. It's a big thing. That is a big <laughs> one. So somebody asked the, uh, the question about... Um, the white tanks on STS one and two, and the uh, you know the trades between uh, thermal conditions and weight. Um, you know, I was part of the group that that, that lived that adventure for uh, for SLS. The early SLS uh, renderings were all white, and uh, and finally went with the uh, the orange natural foam color for the uh, for the core stage. And I had to help with the uh, with the first renderings when we uh, when we made the change. But it's not the weight of the paint that gets you. It's the weight of the water that the paint traps that's the uh, that's the, the the big challenge there. So uh, when they uh, you know they 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 considered the benefits. You know the painting it white makes it more reflective, less heat, keeps the uh, the cryo fuel uh, cool for external tank. Um, versus here's the weight impact for painting the external tank white. And from that perspective, maybe it's it's more advantageous to go white. But they learned that uh, yeah that it's trapping a whole bunch of water in the foam under the paint and it can't get out and uh and so that's why they decided to go with the uh with the orange tanks there yeah and uh i mean for the record the amount of paint that was on those first two tanks only came to about 550 pounds uh total each tank uh but the reason why they did the white originally on Columbia is there was some concern that UV light exposure would make the foam more brittle. So they put the paint over the top and then even before they got to STS-1, their data indicated, oh, it's probably not gonna be a problem. So that's the, so that's the reason why the STS-3 tank was left unpainted. Although funny enough, you still had the white piping on the thing and the white struts. They left the white on there because the contractors had already put the white paint on it. So <laughs> it was just kind of interesting how they were changing things on the fly. Jay Claude's little um, pop culture thing also made me think 
if, if you haven't seen the movie Moonraker, watch a shuttle launch before there was ever a shuttle launch. And it's fascinating to see the speed, the smoke, and how they did it in a time before CGI. There's a bit as it's climbing to orbit, and it's a beautiful contrail. Like, how are they doing that? They put, they were pouring salt out of the bottom of the model with a bright light inside the model. And you're looking at this thing going, this looks as good as anything I've ever seen on camera. And it's all special effects people literally imagining the impossible, but a year and a half from then, possible. What's a shuttle going to look like? We have no idea. We're going to guess. Salt and light. Amazing. They had, yeah. a lot of, they had a lot of experience in doing that when they did the moon landings that way. Mm -hmm. We're still recording. We're still recording. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The... Everybody, uh, your day is finishing. Mine is still to begin, so I'm going to uh, apologize, but I'm going to step out now and uh, get my day underway. But 